of an archive. He sent us some homework this morning. Um, and we'll also then hear from um, Michael Cooperson, professor of Arabic at UCLA on how to read, how to learn Arabic uh, in 1400. And our discussant on Zoom uh, will be Mehmet John Akhtinar at the University of Chicago. Um, so without uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my thanks to friends for organizing this excellent conference, I'm, uh, which I'm learning a great deal, um, more, I think, than normal at conferences. Uh, so what I want to talk about this morning is I want to talk about a paper and some research I'm doing that's an attempt to describe the Arabic Islamic literary critical archive, language archive, uh, language science archive, which, uh, which when uh, Nusheen asked me what I did last night and I was talking about it in that kind of slight hysteria one gets when one's trying to describe the archive on which one works. I was like, it's, it's very big, it's, it's big. <laughs> <laughs> the, the tension that I've got there is, is that the, the archive of language science has a great deal of text in it. And what I'm trying to do is think of a way to describe it that encompasses the full geographical range, the, you know, all the way from Al Andalus to Central Asia. There are, you know, lots of ironies of, uh, you know, identity and positionality here. You know, it's not like the white Arabist from England like, looking for the true Arabic in, in South Asia or in Andalusia replete with with ironies the first of which is that the um what got me started on the research was a collection that Stanford just acquired uh the Kakapel collection of manuscripts from Pakistan and Afghanistan where it's not quite clear whether this is a collection or whether this is a affected bit of book selling to Western uh, universities, like how much is in there, where it comes from, it's all got DDT in it, so now it's getting locked away for a decade. Um, so looking, that was kind of one of my starting points for looking in. The And what I ended up doing in the, the paper that I shared with you is dividing it into two broad streams, an Adab stream and an El stream, as a way to try and think about how when we ask the question, what did people do with poetry? What did people do with language? How did people do the things that we now call literary criticism, philosophy of language, et cetera? How, how did that happen in the archive? And I did it kind of by uh, tracing lines of poetry through the archive, because I think that's one of the key ways the archive works. It takes a single line of poetry at seventh century Iraq, and then people just keep talking about it. Whether they're in Al Andalus, or whether they're in uh, Punjab, or whether they're in Baghdad, or whether they're in the, the Iraq. Aim. What this means is that any kind of work on the archive, when you're following its own logic, you're leaping across different contexts and you're leaping across different time periods. And there's a nice forehead that's got some nice ideas about how when you leap about like this, you have at least the benefit is that you avoid the fallacies of periodization because you just skipped outside context completely. So, Thinking in terms of what people have been saying in the conference so far, what's interesting for me about the, the bit of the paper I'm gonna focus on, which is a C. L. Kuti, who's in the Mughal court in the 1600s, is the extent to which, and this is also true of the Andalusi Adab, the extent to which the, the product, the intellectual production is really defined by a central history that comes from the two Iraqs. So everything that we've been talking about, and this is in light of um, uh, Devin's comments on, you know, that we need newer paradigms to undermine an attack, and, and Hassan's comments on the, like, the meta implications of what an imperial language is. It's when you're reading Sial Kuti, there's just no adjustment to the context. Like we've been talking about how 
how language changes in contexts, how vocabulary, how terminology, how local political developments affect the work, how things take on like their own particular lives in their particular contexts as texts and ideas and modes of poetry and ways of thinking. And you, you just find that in C.L. Kuti and people writing in his particular genre, there's, there's no adjustment. The, like, the archive does not adjust to the context. You can't tell that a C.L. Kuti is in, which comes from the Punjab. You can't tell that he's at the Mughal court. Which is a kind of a different approach to the question that, that Kareem, Kareem was talking about when you can't really have kind of uh, questions of indigenization or auto-colonization in a, in a in text where it's just operating on this kind of imaginary universal level. What I think here is that, and I think here what's critical is that the this applies much more on the ill side of the binary than it does on the, the adab side of the binary. Like the adab side of the binary, when people are tracing um, lines of poetry through you know, collections of literary adab, you know, briefly our Abu Ishaq, Ibrahim al-Husri and al-Andalus, he, he's talking about Abu Nuwais, but then he's talking about Abu Nuwais and making explicit claims about how this is part of an Andalusi literary canon and the contributions the Andalusi literary canon can make to the the Arab, the Arab literary canon as a whole. But so that's the, the aesthetics themselves, like the, the literature itself. But when you start to talk about the science of aesthetics or the study of aesthetics, kalam al kalam, as um, Tawhidi said, when you're talking about language theory about language, it's different and the context kind of falls away. <clears throat> So what I've been doing with um, C. L. Kuti is with these big questions about you know context and framing, what it means to do Arabic at the Mughal court in the in the back of my mind, asking what is it that he's actually saying. So really, the the what I'm trying to do is work out what what arguments C. L. Kuti is making and what this genre of scholarship in which he's working actually does. Um, when, when asking these questions about what's actually happening in the in the texts, I'm thinking, you know, if we're reading scholars writing about language and we're scholars writing about language, how different or similar is what Ossiel Kuti is doing to what we're doing? in this room as a group of you know, transnational scholars working on certain core issues. So, I mean, the, and again, so you would say, you know, uh, do we and we as a group and does us to share with us CL Kuti a particular devotional practice? No. Do we share a particular you know, core set of cultural or political or religious beliefs? No. Yeah, are we are we both doing political propaganda? Like, no. Are we maybe all doing intertextual notations in a particular, reasonably tightly defined science or discipline of scholarship? Yes. You know, I think like the practice of academia is exist today as we all practice it with our footnotes and our references and our core set of texts and our methodological disagreements is not too far away from what uh, Asil Kuti was doing. <clears throat> so just as, you know, in our current context, you can't necessarily tell where one of us works by reading their articles about the text or about the, or about the questions or the subject matters. You can't place people in particular institutions anywhere in the world by reading what they write in English 
what we write in English about the subjects that we write about. Same is true for C. L. Puti. You know, there's none of the things that a comparative literature scholar would look for. There's no orality. There's no hybridity. No kind of melange. All you get is this. The only thing I found is a tiny little mention of Persian, where he just assumes that his audience is, knows Persian. So it's just the language of scholarship in which Persian is just part of that. Again, you know, how many times we read people who quote in French and German and assume that their readership knows French and German. Interestingly, both the C.L. Kuti, 1600s uh, Mughal court, and the um, Abdul Qahir al Jojani, Burghan, 11th century, they have exactly the same presence of Persian in their theories about language. Just a tiny little reference that makes it clear that they know Persian and they speak Persian and they assume that their readership probably knows Persian too. Just so just that's that's it for like the the world outside poking its way into the text. Both the Al Qutian and Chojani I assume that Arabic is the only game in town for their scholarship in the same way as English dominates our context. But again, like C.L. Puti and Al-Jurjani, the Mughal court and the kind of 11th century Iranos, very, very, very different times and places. Very different. Like the world looked completely different when they lifted their heads up from the text. And yet the texts operate in the same logic. The Devin also was talking about how the the language in which the chronicles of Shibani Khan were written didn't affect the content. What was important was the fact that they were commissioned in multiple languages and they only just survived. That's like a limited number of manuscript copies. And Niall was talking about the forgotten, like the communal knowledge, the content, things that get forgotten. What's interesting about C.L. Kuti is that his work is not forgotten. Like this is produced in a imperial setting at the Mughal court in Arabic in the 1600s, copied in great numbers. He's famous in his lifetime. It keeps getting copied for centuries. It makes its way onto the Madrasa curriculum. It makes its way into Anatolia. It makes its way into Egypt. It's printed in a lithograph. It's a, qum, it's a qum reprint of the old edition. And there's a new Darul Qutb in the uh, 2000 and uh, recent in the last kind of decade or so, it's Darul Qutb in the edition. So it's not the forgotten. Absolutely not. So what's happening in this archive, um, which I shared some bits with you this morning, so as to uh, avoid having to do a PowerPoint presentation, but not in a please do all the work for me kind of way, tempting as that is. What's happening here is that rhetorical figures, so concepts like metaphor, metonymy, you know, istiara, kinea, majaz, are providing critics with a vocabulary to think about poetry, just that it's a vocabulary to talk about poetry. As Laura Harbers put it, they show us with figures and tropes what they think is poetic. And this is a, a genre that starts with, with El Giorgiani, who devotes two monographs to the conceptual architecture of imagery, Asrar of Valera, and a second monograph to how poetry and eloquent speech in the Quran manipulate the structures of linguistic content and create conceptual tensions in a sentence. So it's syntax, really, how syntax makes you feel differently in language. That's the letter of jazz. So these two highly uh, influential books were themselves interventions in an established literary critical debate about which lines of poetry are the best, the knock or the, the literally the essaying of poetry. And it adjourns this course, the question of why is the Quran so inimitably beautiful from a linguistic and aesthetic standpoint. And he was trying to provide accurate and sufficient explanations of how mechanisms such as metaphor worked that would then enable him to account for the aesthetic achievements of both the poetic canon in Arabic and the Quran. Across the next eight centuries, there will be a level of kind of granular sophistication, cross-referential complexity, and technical exactitude 
in the archive that was in many ways the fulfillment of Ultra Journey's desire, as he expressed it, to do ill. Right? He wanted to do science, knowledge, ilm that would have a theoretical rigor and entrench a conceptual vocabulary and stand the test of time. So he, he wanted to make ill out of these fields of discussion of poetry. And what happens then in, in the archive, and this, of course, he's writing just before the institution of the madrasa becomes particularly important in the central end across the intellectual landscape. You get a series of abridgments and expansions of abridgments of his ideas. So Khatib al Qazwini in Damascus writes an abridgment of the Sorry, uh, Abu Yusuf al Saqaqi, in a born in present day Uzbekistan, writes a kind of comprehensive encyclopedia of, of all language science that goes all the way from grammar and morphology to the rhetorical theories of Georgiani. Khatib al Qazwini, a scholar in Damascus in the 14th century, does an abridgment of this, makes it into a very small, tight teaching text. Taftazani, the famous Taftazani, then does an expansion of the abridgment of Mutawwal. And um, so that's in the, at the, uh, in the 14th century, and then in Eastern Iran, and then a Sial Puti, when Sial Puti's work that I'm going to be talking about is in the 1600s at the Mughal court, and he's writing a Hershia on the Mutawwal of Taftazani. So he's just he's taking part in the science as it exists and the way that science is structured is this series of commentaries on texts, all of which I mean I don't need to revisit the arguments we all know, all of which are just the way that scholarship is done. They're not dry sale commentaries that are repetitive, they're just how you have new ideas, you have them in this form. However, it's worth noting when we do the comparisons to questions like what is literary theory or what is philosophy of language that, you know, our genre expectations of scholarship don't prepare us for this field structure. Like this is where the parallel to our intellectual production don't apply. Like we look at overlapping abridgments, expansions, notes on commentaries and not how we think of progress, literature, criticism or science. So. So in the archive, uh, Sakaki um, Sial Kuti is going to be talking about how the metaphor itself is constituted and how you know something is a metaphor. Sakaki had this idea that you know something's a metaphor when you can't catch a whiff of the comparison. There's an underlying comparison, two things are being compared, but you can't smell it which is, of course, itself a metaphor, so you can't, like, put your finger on anything in the text that tells you it's a metaphor. You just know it's a metaphor, and that's what makes it particularly beautiful. <laughs> so when we read uh, a Sial Kuti talking about this, how is he going to engage this core aesthetic question of what is a metaphor and what makes it beautiful. So we would have a whole series of expectations for what a discussion of what a metaphor is and what makes it beautiful. And then the Georgiani was, was thinking about affect in, in the same way. Sial Kuti, and he's talking about this exact point, you know, this is, and how I'm, now I'm in the, the Sial Kuti text, um, and so Sial Kuti goes into this discussion of the, he takes the statement, what makes a metaphor beautiful is the fact you can't smell the comparison. And he goes into a little discussion on, well, does that mean if you, if you don't, if you can smell the comparison, does that mean that it's not beautiful or does it mean it's not a metaphor? 
So he's got the statement in the text, absence, if you can't see evidence of the comparison, it's a metaphor. And then he's like, okay, so if you can see comparison, is it not a metaphor or is it not beautiful? What this is, this is a way of thinking that is linked into discussions of logic. No question about it. Like this is just in the same way as Ibn Sina thought that he could reduce the entirety of intellectual um, production to the syllogisms that all A is B, all B is C, so all A is C. The al Kuti is going to always look for sort of the logical implications of literary of, of statements about metaphor. So he's interested in whether the removal of the condition removes both the judgment and the condition or not. He also, and this is interesting, um, it's not just that the metaphor needs to not have any information that it, about the underlying comparison, but he is also, he goes on to say, so ibtidal, popular usage, is something that removes the beauty of the metaphor. So if a metaphor is kind of well-established, like a dead metaphor, as we would call it, then it's less beautiful, but it's not, not a metaphor. It's just a metaphor that's less beautiful. Again, like the way he's coming into it is he's taking these statements about how aesthetics work and putting them in a logical framework. And if this applies to this, and then we convert the statement, we convert the proposition, all A is B to all B is A, does it still apply? Does the negative apply when you swap the terms of the proposition round? And again, the irony here, like he's thinking about elliptical usage, He's in the Mughal court. These are, and there's no, it's as if the language world in which he is actually living doesn't exist. Like if usage is a kind of a purely abstract concept here, I think for CL Kuti. He's not interested in, in the actual use. In the same way as you know, what may have colleagues in the uh, Philosophy departments who, you know, don't seem to care about how people actually speak. You know, they're in their own world of specialized, you know, analysis of how language works. Um, and I'm just going to do one more little bit of a CL booty to give you a bit more of a, a taste. And it's on this, it's, it's connected to the same question. So he's commenting on how the, uh, the underlying comparison in a metaphor, it's like the two things that are being compared to each other in a metaphor, it has to be a clear relationship. It has to be a, a clear relationship. This is something that Tatazani says, has to be clear. Um, the CL Kuti goes on to say, Jala, la yufti ila ibtidal fa inna hu mufawwit lil husn wa tawsiya bil jala inna ma huwa fil isti'ara al tasrihiya li adam zikr al mushabbih fihi bilasihi. So, what he's saying is the clarity, the clarity doesn't take you in the same direction as it being used all the time like being used all the time isn't the same as clarity because being used all the time being a well-known dead metaphor gets rid of the beauty whereas the clarity creates the beauty again it's this like which part of the image is the part that matters what kind of clarity are we talking about are we kind of talking about the kind of clarity that comes from familiarity or are we talking about the kind of clarity that comes from conceptual clarity that reduces confusion. Um, yeah, so Palau Lam Yakun Ship Jalian Yesiru Tamiya. So he's saying, 
استئير الله لصا مشبه به كناية فالقرينة قافية في ذلك كذا في شرح المفتاح الشريف في التدبر فإنه كان خفيا على بعض The Al-Quti is like, hey, you know, people miss this little, you know, subtlety that comes from this small part of this text. And if you had read, you know, a Sayyid Sharif's commentary from several centuries away and several continents, you would know, you would have remembered this particular type thing that the inner metaphor, you're only mentioning the thing that uh it's being compared it's being com the thing that you're comparing it to you're not mentioning the thing that's compared like you're saying uh he is a lion you're not saying he is like oh you're saying a lion throws a spear you're not saying a man like a lion throws a spear you're only mentioning the mushabbah bihi you're not mentioning the mushabbah Okay, the, so those two little examples, it's, it's like you dive into the archive, you see these little moments where C.L. Kuti's position on aesthetics is to either break down, the, is really always to kind of break down the operative concepts and then ask exactly how they're working. So how, what exactly do we mean by clarity? And here's my cognitive structure for metaphor that underpins it what exactly would happen hypothetically if we took this statement about what makes it what makes something beautiful and converted it like a logical proposition he makes references across time and space without mentioning them to Ibn al-Fanar in the Ibn al-Fanari in the 15th century Ottoman world that stayed a Shari culture journey like we've already noticed and so and this isn't equivalent to any kind of European history, or indeed from my very limited knowledge, any kind of um, East Asian history. And it, what should we do with this vast intellectual uh, landscape and this big, big, as I said, this big archive? Like, should we be looking within it to find answers to our own questions about aesthetics? Should we be worrying about its difficult to present nature? Like it's murder to translate. You, you can't translate it. The Arabic isn't written to sound particularly nice. It's kind of clunky. Paraphrase is your only option. Should we be thinking of CL Kuti as the center of the archive or the margin? I mean, yeah, kind of geographically, you would think the margin, but he doesn't think it's the margin. And the text doesn't think it's the margin, if texts can think. The text think it's, it's right in the center of the Islamic hate world. And indeed, it's subsequent reception history. It is right in the center of the Islamic hate intellectual landscape. And yeah, I will end on the right in the center moment. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We next have... Uh, Professor Michael Cooperson of UCLA on how to learn Arabic in 1400. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, friends, for including me in this very distinguished group. Uh, and also, thank you, Professor Akhinar, for agreeing to respond to this paper, which I'm afraid reached you in a somewhat imperfect state. Um, it turns out also that the bio that I've included, that, that was included in the program, is based on what I have on my website, which is decades um, out of date. <laughs> So apparently I have my PhD um, <laughs> and the translation of Al-Hariri, which it claims I'm working on, said has been finished now for some time. <laughs> and in the course of that, um, I came to wonder about how it is that such a difficult text should have been involved in the process of language learning for non-native speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and I thank my colleague Luke Gerber for and, uh, and my colleague Zia uh, Sirat for drawing to my attention this uh, text of the Maqamat of Al-Hariri with an interlinear commentary slash translation into Gilaki, um, which indicates that this extremely difficult text played some role in the interface between languages, which is a bit like learning English from Finnegan's Wake. Uh, <laughs> so how does that work exactly? Uh, there's a close-up, I'm sorry, the, the picture is not very, not very clear. 
Um, well, we take it as axiomatic that non-Muslims should learn Arabic, but it turns out someone actually had to make that case. And the person who made it was a Shafi'i. Uh, my friend Leila Ruhi is in the audience. Thank you, Leila, for joining us. And Leila once gave me some brilliant advice, which is uh, don't ever put lots of text up on your slides because people can't read and listen at the same time. She is absolutely right. However, with this audience, <laughs> think of these as footnotes. We're not going to read them necessarily, but if we would need to come back um, and check my work, it's here. Um, so what does Sheikh Ali say in this argument in the Risala? Basically, first, that non-Muslims should learn Arabic if only to carry out their minimal ritual duties. As it turns out, they needn't worry about their deficient performance because not even native speakers have a perfect command of Arabic. Only the Prophet does. Every Arabic word is known to someone somewhere, but no single person knows them all. And quite interestingly, he says uh, that whoever studies Arabic, whoever learns it from Arabs, from native speakers, uh, becomes min ahli lisaniya. So you become a kind of honorary or adopted Arab. Now, this sounds remarkably egalitarian, and in a sense, I think it is, but it's predicated on the willingness of the Ajam to give up their own language, at least in matters of law, uh, and place themselves in a relation of discipleship to the Arabs. So this appearance of equality is premised on an erasure or an inclusion of non-Arab ancestries and languages. A very similar kind of erasure is evident from this really remarkable statement by Ibn Faris uh, on the three ways to learn Arabic. The first way, he says, is uh, by the Atiyad, which is how children learn. And I do have some data on non-Arabs learning Arabic as children and growing up as native speakers and causing all kinds of conceptual and cultural confusion when they grow up, but we're not going to talk about that now. Um, his second way is by talqin, which I think means repeat after me, okay? uh, that method of just hearing it and spitting it back. And then the third method, I think, is learning uh, Arabic through rules, through grammar, through meta language, through discussion of one's performance and the performance of others. Um, so there's a lot that can be unpacked here, but the main point is that this formulation, again, does not distinguish between native and non-native speakers. And if you look through the rest of his work, uh, Ibn Fadis talks a great deal about uh, errors in pronunciation, and he doesn't seem to distinguish between the error of a Tamimi, for example, who gets the Ayn and the Hamza mixed up versus the error of an Ajami. Uh, and by Ajami, I, I mean the linguistically other, right, the non arabic right? Uh, so, and I use that word not because I endorse that sort of othering, but simply because that's the language of our source. Uh, so, uh, so Ibn Fadis also wants the uh, wants to erase the otherness of the other that is by having him acquire an Arabic and reassuring him that if you make mistakes, uh, well, the Tamimis also make them. Right. So it's a kind of uh, enforced uh, enrollment into this community of imperfect Arabic. Now, Ibn Fadis's comments come temptingly close to looking like a catalog of how people actually learn the language on the ground in real life. Um, but they don't go into more detail. Exactly how is it that you do talqeen? Exactly how is it that you do sama'a? It doesn't explain that. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have in our field what people in classics have, uh, which is an almost staggering amount of detail about exactly those things. So how did people learn Arabic? Well, you know, some of our colleagues, um, no one here, I don't think, um, are, are fond of pointing out that the, the inaugural work of Arabic grammar, the Kitab of Sibaway, was written by an Ajami who must have been doing it to help his fellow Ajam learn Arabic. Well, first of all, there's nothing that we know about Sibaway that's definite enough to indicate that he was or was not a native speaker of Arabic. I mean, his being an Ajami is irrelevant. His being of Persian origin is irrelevant um, to that question. Um, but also, anyone who's looked at the Kitab knows immediately that you have as much chance of learning Arabic from it as you do of learning English from reading Noam Chomsky. Yeah, it's, 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 you can't. 
Um, now, there's one bit of evidence that seems to suggest that people did actually learn in this way, um, but I think that the, that evidence is compromised, but I do want to look at it because it is one of my favorite stories in Arabic. Um, so this is the ninth century renunciant, uh, Baghdad renunciant, Bishr al-Hafi, who actually was from a town outside of Marv. And we know from various kinds of testimony that his Arabic was imperfect. And I even think that I have found some of his mistakes. And the reason I think that that's possible, as unlikely as it may sound, is that he was surrounded by Hadith scholars who were trained to write things down exactly as they heard them. Uh, and so in this case, um, he is quoted as saying, although, you know, again, our, our practices of writing and reading obscure these non-normative performances. What he probably said was something like, Ya obey, ihzak, hadasanak, right? I mean, why should I read it as if he was saying it, right? Because maybe he wasn't. In any case, uh, he goes on and says, Okay. Now, if we translate this as normative Arabic, we disguise that. But I think what he actually, uh, you know, you can translate it this way. Um, then was what? So he's telling Abay, telling his interlocutor uh, not to be seduced by the beauty of hadith study. Um, and then he says of himself, and leaving out the an, which is a feature of spoken Arabic today, um, but not really normative for pre-modern Arabic. So I, I suspect, I guess, or I would perhaps like to imagine that what we're getting here is actually a kind of open mic where we're hearing him speak Arabic in a way that's not entirely normative. All right, well, that, whether it's that or something else, um, he was called out by a guy called an Abbas ibn Abdul Azim al Ambari, who says, Bishr, you're a man who's read the Quran and written down Hadith. So why don't you learn enough Arabic to catch your own mistakes when you speak? Who's going to teach me? Asked Bishr. I will. Go ahead then. Now, how do you translate this, right? Zaydun. <laughs> Right, with all the endings, right? <laughs> the bishop says, why did he hit him? And uh, uh, Abbas says, no one hit anyone. <laughs> Which I translate as a paradigm, and Bishop has this wonderful reply. Uh, now it's tempting here to see in this a kind of resistance, a resentment of the uh, of the imposition of, of this hegemonic character of Arabic, that Bishr, uh, because Bishr really lives out the meaning of the creed that he is that that uh, uh, that, that, that that the most uh, noble among them is the most pious, and he was more pious than many others, uh, and so perhaps he was tired of being called out on his Arabic as if that made any difference, um, and so I'm tempted to see in that kind of resentment of this hegemony. But then again, the story may well be contrived to make precisely that point about his piety. And so I don't want to put too much uh, stock into it. But the point here is that uh, I don't think it would have worked very well to just uh, to, to teach people by this, uh, by introducing these paradigms. And I don't think that's actually how it worked. Um, So how did they learn? Well, I think one way would have been with books like this. This is the Tafsir Muqaddir, which everyone regards as a Tafsir, which it is. Uh, but if you've ever spent any time with it, you will recall that it is mind-numbingly simple-minded and repetitive. It explains every single thing in the simplest possible language, and, it, once it, and when the word comes up again, which it inevitably does, it explains it again using the same uh, who needs to be told uh, that the Rasul include Muhammad, for example, right? Um, let's see. Al-Ladina aminu billah, yani, saddaqu b'tawheed Allah. And so on. Um, it really leaves no stone turned, to be honest. I mean, it just, it's, it's very repetitive and very uh, simple-minded. Now, that, I think, makes it a tafsir that's not terribly interesting as a tafsir. 
as a language teaching book, it's brilliance. This is exactly what you need, comprehensible input over and over again. Um, so I have no evidence based on manuscripts, based on notes, based on any reference in literary sources that anyone used the book this way, but this is the closest thing I've ever been able to come up with to a book that seems like someone might have used it to learn Arabic. So it's kind of the step beyond Talpin, right? Once you have learned to repeat back, then someone explains to you what it means, and this is how they do it. Now, I've said this before to audiences, and someone inevitably says to me, no, 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 it's full of insight. Now, I'm not denying that, that it may be full of insight somewhere, because simply by paraphrasing uh, in the 8th century, you are saying something interesting, of course. Uh, but I, ch I challenge anyone to read a lot of it at once. <laughs> So I think this may be, I submit to your consideration that this may be a language textbook hiding in plain sight. All right, now if we jump forward to 1400, which is what the tin promises, uh, we find some incredibly insightful comments. And I apologize again to Professor Rohi for the amount of text that you see here, but Ibn Khaldun is characteristically brilliant on this point. Um, you expect him to say that studying the Quran will help you learn Arabic. He says, nonsense. First of all, it's inimitable. Secondly, if you learn what's in the Quran, that's all you'll ever be able to say, right? And so your speech will be stilted and limited. Uh, I actually saw this in Turkey some years ago when I went there and didn't know Turkish. Still don't know Turkish. Um, and I got off a bus and these two very nice young men offered to help me out and they couldn't speak English or any, we had no language in common, but they had, they were very religious and they'd studied a lot of Quran. And one of them said to me, <laughs> which is the perfect thing to say, right? It's what God says to Muhammad in the Quran, why not lift the burden that has broken your back? Because uh, I had this heavy suit, right? <laughs> so so um, this can be done, but as Ibn Khaldun points out, uh, it's not a very effective way to learn a language. Um, so how does then, how should one learn it? You learn effective speaking from trying to speak as the Arabs do and from keeping their words constantly in your ears until you grasp the subtle distinctions that result from differences in form. How better could it be said than that, right? Uh, knowing the abstract rules devised by linguists will not make you a better speaker. Those rules will teach you about language, but not how to use it effectively when you need to. So this is essentially a prefiguration of the uh, communicative or proficiency method of language teaching, all of it right here um, in the 14th century. Now, um, so if this isn't what you should do, then what should you do? Well, um, I mean, if, if, if you aren't going to learn it from Quran or from meta language, uh, he says you need to uh, listen to the speech of the Arabs and you need to repeat it until the rhythms of it become natural. Um, and he gives an example of what happens if you take your Arabic from uh, uh, untrustworthy sources. And I couldn't manage to translate this precisely because it's meant to be bad prose. And so, for example, this is what happens. So the, the notion here is that when you don't do it right, you are subject to a kind of mockery by native speakers. Uh, so here's a, a mocking of a letter written um, by uh, a scribe in Qayrawan, Ya Akhi, Wuman la adintu faqdu. So, someone whose loss I should not be deprived of. Alamani Abu Sa'id kalaman in the Kakunta, the Karta, in the Katakunu, Ma'aladina Tati. Waakan al Yom, Felamita al Khruj, Wa Amma Ahl al Manzil al Kilab. So this is a mockery. This is Ibn Khaldun laughing at someone who has gotten his Arabic from the wrong place. Now, this uh, passage of Ibn Khaldun, which is, has been, I think, neglected unjustly, is especially rich because we can bring it into conversation with the testimony of an actual learner who, was, who lived at more or less the same time. And that is Al-Baha Al-Ghuzuli, uh, who is described by his biographers as a Ghulam Turki, uh, which I assume means something like an enslaved male of Central Asian origin. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't tell us what 
Central Asian community he was from or what language he spoke, uh, but simply that he was a Ulam in Turkey. Um, he is famous. Um, he wrote only one book. Um, I should say he, he came from Central Asia, apparently, ends up first in Damascus, then um, to, in Cairo. He, at some point, is manumitted because he talks about um, having to make a living, and he may have sold some kind of, he may have been a trader in uh, woven or spun wool because of his name, Uzuli, um, but I don't have any confirmation of that. He appears in different Adab Majalis, and he wrote this book um, with the wonderful rhyming title, uh, which is an Arab anthology um, consisting of quotations from various sources arranged thematically into chapters that correspond to the points, uh, the parts of a house. Uh, and he dies in 411 or 1411 or 1412 at an early age, perhaps in the plague of that year. But his biographers all say that he died young. Now, in the preface of his work, he takes a very combative tone. He says his book, the Motale al Budur, will strip the binding off all previous collections of poetry and prose. He says, in its sweetness of composition, it outdoes the work of Ibn Khalikan. And if a Zahabi were alive to hear it, he would copy it in golden ink. Ma'a Zahab, a pun on the historian's name. So, only at the end of the book, though, do we learn the reason for all this blustering, which is, he says, that I suffer from which I translate as follows, a heavy foreign accent and a tongue tied in knots, which impede accurate expression and cleave elegance from precision. And yet what choice have I but to try? So evidently then, Al-Ghazuli cannot speak Arabic very well. Uh, and in a phrase that echoes Ibn Khaldun's observation about that groping through the veil feeling when you don't know the language well enough, he admits that he can express himself accurately and he can express himself elegantly. He just can't do both at the same time. And I don't know about you, but I, I've been there. Um, not to say that he didn't try though. Uh, and here we see him actually living out the advice that Ibn Khaldun gives. So here's what he says. This is the, from the chapter on poetry. The learner should hum poetry to himself as he works. If it doesn't flow, don't push it. If it clicks, keep going. But remember to take a break when you need to. Choose content that appeals to you and suits your personality, since emotional expression is something that needs to be coaxed, it can't be forced. So this is obviously very good advice, uh, but it has a certain poignancy to it because uh, if he really was a slave, he may in fact have begun his Arabic learning career humming or singing to himself as he's performing some sort of humiliating manual labor. Um, so in any case, uh, apart from that, I don't know, but he is certainly trying to somatize this idea of the of Arabic prosody. Um, and he, whether on someone's advice or just through instinct, he has realized that he needs to do it. He needs to generate some kind of a rhythm uh, to help him acquire the tonalities of the language. Um, so, uh, once you've done this, he says, a few original lines will come to mind. Uh, and when you have enough, put them together into an ode. Um, and um, if, uh, yeah, so you, you can compose your own poetry by simply composing a few lines every time. Now, uh, as it happens, we, we have an external confirmation of the efforts that he made to improve his Arabic. And this is quite unusual. Um, so according to uh, the poet Abu Bakr al-Munajjam, who is quoted by a Sakhawi, uh, we have this. Al-Ghuzuli is the one, uh, so this is Sakhawi saying that he's the one mocked by Abu Bakr al-Munajjam, he zajjal hajaru bih. Yasma'a jayyidan wa yafham lakin ma yaqulu shi. So Al-Ghuzuli is sitting here in the Majlis, unable to speak. And then uh, Sakhawi sort of takes mercy on him and says, uh, <laughs> So by dint of this unremitting effort, he eventually gets better. And we have external testimony of him sitting there quietly and then one day maybe, or maybe just doing it in, in writing. Uh, 
Um, so the budur then, I would say, actually, it's the writing, is his revenge. He may not be able to speak, but he can write or at least copy the passages he likes and string them together with elaborate prose. And so I think some of us have been there too, right? We can perform perfectly well in a second or third language, provided we have time to look things up and correct our mistakes. However, you may have noticed something odd here, um, which is this, and this is my last point. Ghuzuli's confession of Arjma is not simply correct or competent, it's eloquent. Uh, it contains perfect examples of genes, genes ishtipak to be exact, which is things like Arjma and Arjuma, morphological parallelism, muqabala, uh, and prose rhyme. So there's something disingenuous about his claim to ineloquence when this uh, performs all of the things that Professor Key has enlightened us on. So what's going on? Oh, and furthermore, um, his choice of this, these, these words, the Rijma Filisan, echoes the Uqda Filisan that Moses suffers from in the Quran. So it's as if he's saying, well, mock me if you like. But remember that even the prophets of God have not always spoken clearly. Now, since the Nahda, we have been taught that uh, rhetoric is a triumph of form over content, that it's full of uh, empty verbiage and uh, it's symptomatic of the decline and decadence of uh, Oriental culture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I wanna push back on that, uh, especially to our intuitive feeling that there's something difficult about this, that it would just be much easier to say what we think, right? Um, and I think that that's a, a profound anachronism and an error uh, because it's the rule governed character of this kind of writing as Ibn Khaldun told us, it's the regularity of it, it's the predictability of it uh, that makes it much easier to produce for non-native speakers. And conversely is also difficult to produce even if you are a native speaker. And so it creates, in that sense, a, a place of equality, a space of equality for native and non-native speakers. Um, so just to give you a final example here, if we look, now, I don't care how bad your Arabic is, or anyone's Arabic is, you can fill that out. All you need maybe the first year or two of Arabic, and you can do it. Right? So this, I think, is what makes it possible for people like al Zuli to be um, to become part of this community. It's this, it's precisely what we identify as content-free and burdensome that actually creates a framework within which uh, there's a space of equality between uh, native and non-native speakers. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have very uh, We'll turn to our uh, discussant, John Akhtanar at the University of Chicago, who's with us on Zoom. Mm. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning to Canada, to West Coast. Unmute yourself. You can you yourself. can you hear me well? Uh, okay. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, you, to, you don't hear me. Uh, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? I think you. We can't hear you. The earphones. No. Can you hear me now? Do you hear me? Excuse me. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, just a second. So people hear me on Zoom. Uh, I think people can hear me more. Can someone else on the chat try to talk on Zoom to see if it's on? They hear. I think it's us. Yeah, I think people can hear, but. Uh, wow. Okay. We need to do you hear me. Do you hear me now? Do you hear me? Hello. Maybe it's us. Okay. Yes, so why don't we why don't we start discussion and in the meantime. Uh, so apparently it's on the problem is on our side. So why don't we have like a few minutes, you know, conversation with, with, with colleagues and then uh when when it's fixed, uh you know, we'll 
be listening to you. I'll just really Hello. Yeah, okay. It's fine for me. Right. Oh. Can you hear now? Yes. I think now. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, well, the, there is only one issue, which is okay. I think now you hear me, and I don't hear myself back. That's good. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, good morning to uh, Canada. I have never been to Canada, but my, this is my first vir virtual uh, presence there. Um, uh, I would like to thank the organizers as well as putting this uh, wonderful conference and the uh, wonderful papers. I enjoyed reading both of the papers. And I think it's, uh, it gives, uh, it shows the complexity of the Arabic language as is clear to many of us. Arabic is a very rich language. It is also very complex, a lot of complex issues. And we are not the first ones to face, confront such problems or issues. Uh, it has been a, a topic of inquiry since I would say for, uh, since the late antiquity, uh, since the seventh century, and I think the both presenters show us in uh, show us very successfully how rich this effort uh, of the Arabic scholars uh, were in trying to understand, make sense of the Arabic language. Uh, and one paper I think is uh, by Professor Cooperson shows the more kind of the pragmatic aspect of the language in uh, the value of the mastery uh, of using the language, uh, language as a kind of a social and a uh, intellectual capital uh, to gain some respect, uh, authority, within the society. And I think the example of the uh, Baha'u'ddin al-Wuzuli exemplifies this uh, very successfully. Uh, the other paper by Dr. Uh, K also opens up a huge treasure box of the vast amount of uh, scholarship uh, dealing with painstaking uh, linguistic analysis, uh, even on very minute uh, uh, questions uh, reading a verse or a kind of a certain word and how this tradition continues for centuries and what I actually like is that the both uh, papers uh, try uh, to bring this kind of rich experience to uh, the modern times to our own questions uh, the beginning point I think in Dr. K's uh, paper he emphasizes this the people they were they were scholars writing about the language we are also writing about the language uh, and also the uh, professor cooperson mentioned the nahda the uh, people who were considering about their linguistic tradition and their heritage and in both cases i think there is this whole question of how much of this previous scholarship can speak to us and how much of it can be uh, can should be uh, integrated in our ways of thinking. I especially like uh, the way Dr. Key uses the word archive. Uh, I don't know if it's intentional. I mean, it clearly refers to the Stanford uh, archive and and the, the manuscripts there. But at the same time, referring to this entire corpus uh, as an archive which means it's there on the waiting for further investigation and kind of the doors are closed to us. Uh, I, I, ex I actually like this uh, metaphor. Um, <clears throat> with respect to, uh, I think both questions, I think it's very clear as a specialist of the earlier period, I can uh, say the, if we go to the 8th century, we have uh, uh, Sibawai, who is engaged in the language, and he is himself someone uh, also not a native speaker. Uh, and, uh, and the Professor Kuponson's point, I think that the uh, 
ground uh, that it creates this investigation into how to obtain or acquire a new language. And the way to do it is through learning uh, statements or aphorisms or quotations, uh, kind of creating an egalitarian platform for both native speakers and non-native speakers. I think that can be also a, as a question applied uh, to the inquiries into uh, the literary studies, which Dr. Uh, K was presenting. So my question would be, um, by a kind of a very detailed study of uh, the linguistic aspects of Arabic language and the whole literary criticism and all these books written, do they also create a platform uh, uh, kind of a scholarly platform to eliminate this kind of distinction between natives and non-native uh, speakers. I think this is where maybe the, the two papers can uh, talk to each other. Uh, apart from that, I uh, might, I'm not going to take long, but <clears throat> maybe give you one example uh, that in uh, the 8th century, the Umayyad Caliph Abdul Malik, he has actually was interested in teaching Arabic to his uh, two sons who were notorious in writing bad language, bad Arabic and was criticized many of the other scribes. And uh, he has a kind of a quote is attributed to him, uh, which says a through <clears throat> uh, a defect in the mouth of a noble man is disfiguring as a pockmark and uglier than a rip in a fine garment. And then we have find, we find treatises about uh, written to the scribes as well as to the princes that they should learn an, uh, a Quran as uh, the first one of the first sources to improve their Arabic. Uh, they should uh, memorize poetry and pre-Islamic poetry, etc. This is, uh, I think, all indications that show us a kind of a general uh, pre-modern way of how to uh, understand language. And you mentioned, uh, Professor Kupus, in the example of Muqatil. I would tend to agree with you. Uh, this We have several other uh, tafsir works similar to those, like the, the tafsir attributed to Ibn Abbas uh, or the Mujahid tafsir, which is just glosses. It's nothing uh, explaining just uh, a word and explaining another, giving synonyms. And we, I think, rip. Andrew Rippon was arguing that it is uh, a way to think people were memorizing the text, not necessarily native speakers. And the complexities of the language is just like offering as they memorize or reciting the Quran, giving just like a short explanation to it. And another example might be interesting in language ex ex acquisition is the Zamakhshari's Muqaddamatul Adab. Uh, he, as a native speaker of Turkish, uh, in Saint, uh, Turkish of the time, he wrote this book to non-natives, uh, I mean, a, a book to teach Arabic mainly, and it is one of the earliest sources that includes a lot of Turkish vocabulary from the uh, 12th century. And I think there we can have an understanding of uh, how the language uh, they thought should be taught to non-native speakers. Uh, I think there is plenty of room for us to think about, especially uh, that can relate to modern language pedagogy, and we are still dealing with similar problems there. Yeah, thank you. I like I have a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, and the the Ghazuli, I kind of I don't see the Ghazuli as well. When he saw that, like he has all these interesting little self-reflexive. Why am I doing this? Which is great. Um, and he's also much more familiar and easy to read than, and much easier therefore to translate than Seal Kuti. So I was wondering, like, bearing in mind that this. That along with the language theory project is the language pedagogy project, which has vast amounts of resources by by Sylvia and the actual case, the vast central media complex, there's so much, you know. And exactly like you said, I never thought of that substituting in like 
uh, such a like a way to learn. Why is Sinal Kuti so invested in Arabic and so completely uninterested in, in writing like that? And the Kuti, the Kotba, he doesn't have a Kotba, he just starts straight off with the same kind of steady analytical prose that I was reading out. Okay, why? But what's why is Arabic so important to him? But but he's not interested in doing what you described. I have to think, I have to read him. I haven't read him, so I, I don't know. But thank you for that challenge. I will consider it. I don't know. I mean, I, I you don't. Not everyone has to write in the ornamental yeah. style, right? And I suppose there are people who become so good at it that they no longer need they throw the crutch away right they, they climb the ladder and then they kick it away right so maybe he was like that i don't know i'd have to read and see um, so yeah I mean, maybe it's even wrong to ask about class. These are uh, the bigger projects to divorce yourself of context and the century. On the other hand, oh my God, this work speaks to all the debate about whether there is Indian blends or Indian style of blend. Uh, now, you know, the last time I read that scholarship, but you know, I think that. The heart of it was actually the question of the metaphor and whether there's an Indian style of poetics that um, uh, where where the metaphor requires some labor to for the reader to uh, to connect. Uh, I think the other outside of the and so it seems like you know one way you could be reading this is, is um, maybe you know depending on how you kind of Frame the debate whether it's the other media or something like that, or, or Indian style of poetry. Second, uh, uh, that you know, Sialkoti is taking a position right, that he's actually writing Arabic criticism for readers of Persian poetry um, and taking a position on the aesthetic and, and, and the way he writes degree of clarity. So, uh, so, so I don't know. Maybe there is a lot there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of hopping on some of the similar notes. So, um, uh, you know, can we also think about, you know, sure, that is sort of the cosmopolitan, uh, the cosmopolitan uh, sort of uh, phenomenon of Arabic, etc. And, you know, Across centuries, and basically, I mean, obviously, they are also kind of pushing sure. back against the idea of, of a canon, right? Canon that's archived. That's why you're using this language. So, but obviously, I mean, sometimes, what you know, this is more of a question. I mean, can we also think about you know scholarly communities, right? And and the other thing that came to my mind is is the idea of I mean, my work on on, on poetry, right? So. Um, my good friend and colleague from Budapest, he, he, he was looking at the phenomena of Nazi Ragui, so the you know, imitation. Right? And he looked at these, you know, he looked at these poets, you know, imitating poetry that ultimately that went back to Hafez. So Hafez was obviously, right? But actually he found out in 15th century, uh, but, he, but he found out that actually, uh, yeah, and he was yeah he was writing about selling selling the first of the Ottoman Sultan's Persian poetry, and basically he realized that actually yeah sure Hafiz was kind of the ultimate uh, the subject of of imitation, but actually the 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 imitate the imitating poetry was actually imitating poets of the fifteenth century, right? So I was wondering if if this would also this could also be a a way of you going about sort of you know, you know, solving the problem of context and periodization, et cetera. But maybe it's a trap, as you also indicated. I mean, it's our kind of obsession 
uh, with uh, you know, historicizer, right? Or maybe the two, uh, maybe the two sort of dynamics are both at play, right? So both, both, you know, our our attempt at sort of, uh, sort of making a coherent enough narrative, but also there is also this sort of matrix of of of, of Arabic cosmopolitanism. Right? So, more. Yeah, I mean, I, I have, I mean, it's a bit of 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 a bit It would, I, I haven't yet found anything that links the authorities, the intellectual production of his output to the literary and the kind of poetry in which he includes Persian worlds that he must have been living in. And all of his other books are in, are in logic, basically. Um, and, in, and that's why I ended up making this ad hoc film split. It seems like the logics are kind of different in these two streams. Um, I guess because the Theo Kuti, he, he doesn't, and you notice there wasn't, when I was reading Theo Kuti, there wasn't any poetry. He's kind of not really interested in the poetry anymore, perhaps. He's interested in the, the thick or the discussion of how language functions, which is really, in the end, it's a logical question. It's like, how does how can we map on cognitive processes based on the input language? And poetry is a kind of an interesting example of how this works. But, but again, unlike Muslim Dooley, he's not thinking about the poetry. And then you know, I worry that this like thinking about poetry is some product of my own context and like what well, thinking about poetry means, you know, how literary studies is separate from positive language today. But yeah, I would I would. I'm gonna. I would love to find something that could link the you know, some moment that could actually link the other to the to the conversation that you must have had. Right. No, I mean, I I think you're right. Actually, I think I disagree with that. Yeah, I think that there's at least in the Ottoman case, there are two separate traditions of rhetoric. There's a Persian tradition, which is coming Persian or Chancellery. Um, material, which is mainly there to create beautiful sounding words or orders, histories. Uh, and then there's the madrasa based material that's coming from, you know, Sakati, Kantazani, etc. That it is completely disconcerted with logic. It's just teaching people how to do logic. Uh, and that's all they want to do with it. They're not, I don't think they're interested in the poetry, at least in the autumn madrasa case. It seems similarly to the rural case. So I think on that sense you're right. One uh just in terms of the archive, I was wondering if you ever looked at Brinkley Messick. I missed the first few minutes of your talk, but Brinkley Messick in his uh Sharia scripts, the second book, he had a useful distinction between the archive and the library, in which he was trying to think about how Islamic law basically functions on sort of two levels. So on one hand, you have the archive, which is the court records, which is full of local detail and social context and has direct speech of people and information because all court records are just focused on one case at one particular moment in time, right? And then you have this kind of abstraction, the Bakwa, which is the library in which it's supposed to be universalizing and deleting all social context. And uh, you're not supposed to be able to place it in any way or shape or form. Anyways, I found this useful because I also had to deal with the question of um, the revival of Paris geography texts, of, you know, Shafastani, these sorts of things in the Ottoman case after 1500. And they just refused to engage at all with contemporary heresies. They just kept repeating all the medieval stuff. Um, my way of trying to, my story, I was interested in trying to find the social in it. I basically went to the manuscripts, looked at how people were reading them, paratextual elements, et cetera, et cetera, to locate that in the social. And then just my final thought is that whenever I try to think about what is the equivalent of certain forms of pre-modern Islamic 
uh, scholarship today. I always think, uh, especially because of this mother's uh, commentary, it's, uh, I always think of comparative lit, where it's they're not really interested in the text in the literature anymore, right? It's just a mechanism in which then you could then go out to discuss uh, a canon of critical theorists. And then each book is just, I mean, you can read them in the commentaries, right? This is whatever. Uh, uh, right. the, the Hannah Arendt and Lorenzo Foucault, and then go to Shemitian or something like that. In it. And that's it. You just you've got these fingers, and then, and then the, the original text is irrelevant to the larger philosophical discussion that they're having. I mean, I want to continue because, first of all, I don't agree the Medrese uh, because from Medrese, some of the best personal poets came out, but also the personal realm in Ottoman Empire was really involved in different ways with the Medrese texts, maybe not necessarily doing their work. Uh, but uh, Alexander's case it is really interesting to me, like discussion of metaphor without citing, you know, quoting poetry, <laughs> because poetry was the shavakat or many usages of language. So uh, is metaphor like rhetorical devices versus usages like meanings of words, how they are uh, separate by tradition, especially in my book, I'm looking at commentaries and I think their individual interests as well. Maybe uh, Alexander's person was not that interested in poetry or not very successful, like Fuzuri is accepting his lacking in Arabic, etc. So uh, I think those individualities are really more important than approaching from these, uh, you know, prose versus poetry as um, generalizing about them in any period or uh, spatial conditions because people find opportunities in different genres and different styles to fill in gaps, most probably in an intellectual network of their time and space kind of a thing in that universal interest on what came before them, picking up and adding. And in the maelstrom of Quranic language, there is this all different individual choices, redirecting the tradition by finding something obscure, just like today, somebody can pick up a 19th century philosopher nobody talked about, and then start a new trait of Foucauldian thinking over that. Like, I mean, Spinoza, for example, and Jewish mysticism and communism is a very big, uh, like, trend now in thinking. So I think. How to describe this is our task. <laughs> and how to understand in different contexts that like, how to approach an individual as a part of such a complex system, kind of a node uh, through uh, their production, like written production, and that it is it was preserved for some reason. We don't know why exactly. And like archive in that sense is very coincidental to some degree. It is not. Uh, you know, <laughs> not everything preserved because of the same reason. Like, you know, but I mean, like accidents. So, so your guy, maybe nobody read him. How <laughs> <laughs> you're introduced, injecting him in our system. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what's interesting is that uh, Puti, on the one hand, is the most Puti, I mean, I don't want to. I worry about us calling him some kind of edge case, but there's definitely a sliding scale within the archive. Like people are all writing commentaries on them somewhere on the But then it's very different. I'm probably much more interested in in concept than in that. And CL Kuti is much more interested in logic. And Sakazani is is much more interested in like intellectual history and then say it's Shaif is like closer even to a journey. Um so there's like a sliding scale within the archive. And yeah, it, 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 I don't know, I shouldn't be able to look at the things in that thing, but I would, I mean, I use archive to mean the big imaginary thing, where I would use the library to mean the physical thing that we might have a catalog for. Um, anyway, Theo Kuti keeps nudging us to read around the archive, like this, like, you should remember, say, the Shari, you should remember what Karshani says. You should remember, he refers to well, Alpari. Well, like, you should remember, you should read this logical text. He keeps telling his readers that if you're going to be around the archive, like he is. 
I don't think my answer is that I believe in interesting journalists as well. Somebody wrote on the margin of one of the copies of the Alpharuti that we have a Sanford that it reminded them that they, someone should go look at how much else and you know, they give a direct quote such a way. So the archives, like the material archives, are really good as well. I think I have an answer to your question. Ooh. Farabi, right? He, he, he's a non-native speaker and he writes in this language that's completely unadorned, very meticulous, um, very lapidary, right? Very squeezing all of the oomph he can get out of every grammatical form. Uh, so there may, if Guti is, as as near suggests, I mean, but going back, back, back in time, if there's a counter tradition of philosophical brevity, which, given the expanse of time and space we're talking about, seems entirely likely, right? There's a a counter tradition of Arabian, right? It's the Hemingway of Arabic, right? You just, or the Wittgenstein, right? You 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 strive for an impactful but minimally complex form of expression. So in any case. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm suspecting that he's drawing from that mushroom rather than from Ibn Jinni, who's the one who starts us on Sajjah. Yeah. As Wolfhart noticed, and no one picked him up on it, but he, he says it all comes from Ibn Jinni, mm -hmm. and it, it does, actually. Yeah, and again, he's using more silk boots, yeah, it's not. He's going to use morphology to show that he knows how it works. He's going to use the right form, but he's not going to fit in to establish the kind of the road. Yeah, exactly like what I've been doing. I think our, our last two um, are yeah. um, when I was listening to your talk, um, maybe the healthy is it is that provides a lot of you know, fluff teaching, you know, one of those papers. I hate those, right? <laughs> I think your talk is to touch a realistic and compelling philosophy of teaching, mm. especially for language instructors. Um, it was just really, really amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I kind of have a second question to you that feel free to ignore. If your, your meditation on what it meant. Uh, for example, to, to think about philosophy of language and literary criticism in the Mughal era, how do you think your work is going to be read 100 years from today as a primary source? What would it look like to look at what you're doing as a primary source? Yeah, yeah, that's that's why I think the only, uh, the only thing, fingers crossed, the only thing that might be read in 100 years is a translation. Uh, Yeah, and the rest of it, it's probably not like to see all the like it's you know, little nitty crazy questions. Yeah, let me do it by time. Yeah, yeah, thank you for too splendidly erudite paper to lace through with jokes, which is just as it should be for a Saturday morning session. Alexander, like several others, I was, I was thinking, you know, about this. this search for the absent context and uh, it reminded me years ago I wrote an article about looking at some Sufi texts, one of the Persian Sufi texts, and then particularly sort of the Adab al Mudadim type text that seems to be utterly devoid of any context I'm looking for as a historian. And, and I describe these as a as, as no transcendental rhetoric that are really you know, deliberately trying to transcend all time and space to sort of float above, as distinct from the, the Tuscan the sort of commemorative hagiographical text, which are writ through with all of that kind of quotidian detail of, of ordinary people clinging to the heavens of the saints to, you know, for, to be, you know, it's the ravages of time and sort of commemorated. And, and now when I look back on that, really, I think this, this it sort of makes sense because the Adab al type texts are, are deliberately linking to a tradition of this is a behavior, these are modes of Adab, of behavior and so on, which have been passed down through through time and so on. And, and that's something rather distinct from the, the, the purposes of choosing a, a different genre of the, the hagiography, the Tusker, the book of memory, commemoration specific. But, but be that as, as it may, I was really sort of struck thinking about the, the specifics of the context of at the same time or thereabouts, of, uh, I think exactly when Sial Koti lived, but the Mughal court. This is the time in Persian of the, the, the Tazagui, isn't it? This sort of new style of really doing things differently in this very Baroque style. 
But then I guess looking through to a later panel by the early 20th century in, in, in Iran, this stuff is being you know, rejected as the Sabkindi, which is too Baroque and not pure enough, et cetera, et cetera. So I was really struck by the fact that you seem to you were saying that Sian Koti is is cited, is remembered, is reread, is reprinted in litho and modern editions and so on. So I was simply just out of sheer ignorance. With the Nahda or otherwise, what's happening with, because, uh, well, I mean, Bill Grant in the 18th century is making a case for the of Arabic, Indo-Arabic poets, and we're good enough, etc. even though we're from the Ajam, from him. But is there a, does the Nahda have a, a position? on, you know, this Indian Arabic stuff, or, or is it, you know, certain, let's say the transcendental genres, they carry on, but stuff that is perhaps more a sort of, I don't know, so to speak, an Arabic Tazagui from India, doesn't. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just my own ignorance. Is there any sort of anything one can say about the, the, the Nafta's reception of different Arabic texts from India? Georgie Zaydan was in correspondence with, I think uh, Mossin wrote about this in his dissertation. I don't remember which Indian, contemporary Indian scholar. That's it, yeah, thank right. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So evidently there was some, there must have been some interaction there. Well, but Zaydan, I think, go ahead, sir. No, I'm sorry, it went, it, the rejection went the other way. Simply writes a rejection and say that. That's it, yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. But yeah. And on, on the reception of the text, and I, could, I should be corrected if I'm wrong, the Nakhda's attitude was based on this stuff, uh, the Mutalbo commentaries, the al Kuti, is exactly what we don't want to right. recapitulate. This is what Ahmed says in the book. You know, that they were facing kind of the same problem of how do we compete with European modernism? We need mono author monographs. So we can print them with a certain name and claim genius for them. And Georgiani is right there from the 11th century, but then all the subsequent accretions is just harder to package in that part of that moment. Yeah. yeah. Are we in time to that one? For a question in my head. I hope you can deal with uh, two questions. Uh, uh, Zuli, so he had a strong accent, but he also died young and he was a slave. So he must have been brought to Damascus as a teenager or later, right? But then do you know what kind of died? I'm just thinking because it's interesting that he started Arabic so late, but eventually he was able to get to this level. So like it must have been in a process of a few years that he was able to acquire a kind of high level um, I'll see it in Arabic. And um, the other thing is speaking about, you know, whether or not uh, eloquent Arabic or rule based Arabic is really actually a space of openness. Is, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen you read like uh, Arabic written by Christians, like Paul of Aleppo or things like that. Uh, it's incredibly simple. It lacks all of the rhetorical yeah. basis, or it doesn't feel at all like anything that. Uh, the Arabic that uh, you know, Muslims are writing in Damascus at the same time. And, and I always thought it's because they just don't have, they're not trained in, you know, Balaba and all this and this material. So they write correctly, but it's just, it's almost like how they speak or just you know, plainly. And I was just wondering, uh, you know, if this is open to everyone, why don't they write in that way? And also, Right, so Huzuli, I think I suspect, and it's very sad, has very sad implications for him, but uh, I suspect that whatever language he spoke, he didn't have interlocutors in Cairo or in Damascus. So he may just have had no one to talk to. Imagine that, right? That he he lands there with no language to speak, to share with anyone. So he's forced to speak Arabic, right? Um, and as to the Christians, yeah, there's an article, uh, Claire, um, She's at Leiden. No, no, she's in Groningen. And she has a, a artic, articles on how Christians learned Arabic. Oh. Well, I wanted to talk about that and I didn't have time. Um, so she's looked into it, but I, I, the very short version I think is that they just didn't have access as you said, right? There was just, and so they had to do the best to kind of clean up their army and giving us middle Arabic, right? Yeah. Um, but it's a distinct difference, absolutely. It's a very different language. And I don't, so it's a space of equality I should have specified non-native Muslims, right? Not any non-natives. 
Yeah. Yeah. So definitely Mawali, not not everybody, not so whether I was up in the mess. We've gone quite a bit. We should probably continue this over. I'll be right. Thanks very much. For the thank you for those really helpful suggestions. That's thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good day. A good conference. Well, we have five minutes until the next panel. <laughs>
So he compiled these uh, being influenced by one who some from 15th century who uh, did another versified grammar book of Persian. In that case, not exactly what Shahidi did, but Shahidi was also claiming that he was updating Hussam's uh, glosses and making it more like a Mevlevi, Mesnevi vocabulary kind of a thing for Persian learn uh, learners of Persian to understand. He doesn't say like learning, but understanding Mesnevi, this will help. But I don't know how, because it's just like versified, like this means that, that means this, et cetera. And very mundane vocabulary is there, like everyday use vocabulary, not only those mystified enigmatic words. Anyway, uh, we started with Aslan uh, focusing more on uh, commentaries that started like uh, mid 16th century onward. There are like uh, 56 different texts around Tuhfe of Shah Khedir. Uh, I say different, like 20 of them are commentaries uh, with glossing each word that is cited in prose in Turkish. And then others, there are translations of the Muslim, even like in, uh, I think it's Oxford, uh, Bodleian, uh, there's a copy like with English interlinear translation of the text, like uh, in a manuscript copy, like Brian Cox, I don't know who he is. Uh, but, uh, and uh, there are extractions uh, because the text is not only providing the vocabulary, but also it is like 27 chapters, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then each chapter introduces a particular arus meter, use of arus meter with its differences in different places. Each chapter is organized analytically, like there's a quatrain that starts the chapter with some low uh, themed uh, verses that include the Mustaf Ilun, Mustaf Ilun, Mustaf Ilun, one line of the uh, name of like and how the uh, meter works. And then last uh, couplet also uh, reintroduces the meter. And in between there are 10 to 15 lines each chapter with uh, one couplet, including up to six, eight uh, vocabulary items, even in Persian and Turkish Persian and Turkish or Turkish Persian, different ways of organizing each couplet, but all of them are vocabulary couplets. And then one more couplet uh, signs the chapter, which is like a macaronic verse, one line Persian, and it's Turkish translation, second hemistic. So uh, it is a very ornate and interesting uh, kind of composition, maybe, that is the interest behind this uh, an enormous focus on this text uh, among the Ottoman intellectuals from Baghdad to, I don't know, like Bosnia or uh, everywhere to the Shahidi, a copy of it comes out of the inventories of libraries, inheritance records, etc. It is a, like very difficult to trace its uh, transmission history because the shape of the text also changed. Some people dropped the quatrains and ran copying. Some people focused on only quatrains and the Aruz, like there are risales written by those quatrains about Aruz system, etc. So. It is like a very modern text becoming an obsession for Turkish writing Ottomans as well. Like, I mean, it is uh, also, it starts a commentary, like it is at the beginnings of a commentary tradition that starts mid 16th century that focuses on Persian texts like Divan of Hafez or Gulistan, Bostan. These are the like Murat Inan worked on these texts uh, in his dissertation and a series of articles. But this Tufei Shairi is different. This is not like a part of Persian can canon necessarily in Anatolia, but like Shahidi, Mevlevism, et cetera, these are our interests in this project while we look at commentaries because most of the commentaries are uh, from people from the Western ends of the empire, not all, but uh, I, I am more interested in Baghdadi's uh, 1667 commentary because uh, he's from Baghdad, first of all, and he's a very famous Arab, uh, 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 like we, we say Arab, we don't know exactly what he speaks like kind of, but a, a very learned man from Baghdad who studied Turkish apparently enough to write lengthy commentaries. 
and Persian uh, by his choices of poetry. He kind of established a dictionary of Shahname, archaic words uh, from Persian to Turkish, explaining in Cairo. He lived in Cairo. He got education in Damascus, and we know his uh, biography uh, more or like he is, first of all, his life is in the essays on literary biography, or literary bi biography. And then uh, Mohit Bey's uh, famous uh, biographical dictionary has a very lengthy section about his life. But uh, what uh, Baghdadi does is different from other um, uh, texts. But before coming to this, in this project, uh, Aslan and I would like to develop a classification of different commentarial engagements with this text, Tuhwe Shahidi. Our primary aim is to challenge the notion that Tuhwe is a simple language primer, which has led to the relative neglect of analytical engagements with the commentarial tradition around Tuhwe. We argue that the commentaries of Tuhwe, we can go to the second line. This, is, this slide gives some information about Shahidi, second one. Next one. It doesn't work. The previous one. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, this is. Yeah. Uh, so, like in our project, we argue uh, that commentaries of Tuhwe are important sources for understanding Ottoman cultural history, but not only that, also uh, particularly uh, the construction of an urban identity, which we call Ottoman uh, historically sometimes, namely Rumi identity or civility. Although it is commonplace to claim that knowledge of the Persian language and canon was a key ingredient of this Rumi self-fashioning, we need further studies to understand how this acculturation to place and how Persian mate uh, is this. Uh, moreover, it is important to recognize the varieties of this particular culture of learning, ranging from basic Persian vocabulary and a few famous couplets to the ability to speak intelligently about the famous poetry compilations to discussing the fine theoretical questions of Persian rhetoric. The commentarial tradition on Tufei Shahidi reflects this variety of Persianate urban acculturation. On, on the one hand, we have commentators who explicitly announce that they will not engage with commentarial traditions and instead will note the learning of Persian as it takes place within the social context between the pupils and the instructor. And uh, many of the commentators mention how they started with learning his vocabulary Shahidi provides, and then taking notes as a part of learning experience, and then forming their texts. For example, Baghdadi mentions 20 years ago from 1667, uh, while he was learning to be Shahidi, he started collecting all these notes that refer to not only uh, like around 60 different grammars and grammatical works, glosses, etc. And he engages with them either rejecting or supporting their arguments about particular glosses. So it's a very, uh, Bagradis is one of the most detailed uh, commentaries on this Lugat, uh, on this Tukve, uh, among the 20 that I mentioned. And uh, also he uses Shewahed. Bagradi is uh, famous for one word for volume work of Izanetul Adab, a collection of uh, Arabic verses and uh, commentaries and glosses on these verses. Uh, and it was printed in 19th century. Apparently he is very famous as an Ottomanist, of course, I don't know anything about Arabic literature. And then uh, like, um, but Baghdadi's focus on Shahidi, et cetera, must be his, about his friendship with the Turkic, uh, Turkish governor of Egypt uh, at that time, Cairo, uh, with whom he would travel to Istanbul and he would present his works to Ottoman Sultan Mehmet IV. So uh, how does uh, Baghdadi approaches this, uh, like, how to connect Baghdadi's work with our larger project of Rumi identity is really intriguing because so far Rumi identity is generally identified with Istanbulites and uh, central lands like Anatolian lands or Balkans 
of the empire, but not as of Arab, Arab lands under Ottoman uh, rule was uh, not as roomified kind of a thing because the border wild east of the empire kind of a thing. Uh, but Baghdadi is a case, uh, like a case as an individual with his intricate knowledge of Turkish, Arabic, and Persian kind of is distinguished among his peers to some degree. And I would love to hear about such gentlemen living in that time or later years, I don't know, uh, and uh, having a command, such good command of all three high literary languages and so much so that he can compose large text. Uh, I mean, um, I may get into more detail uh, about his uh, style, but uh, let me make it clear, like his work, second slide has more details about his work. His work is like I'm um, only a commentary on the first 10 couplets, first chapter of Shaidi, which neglects the quatrain in the original text. And uh, for 10 uh, couplets, which take like two pages at most in manuscript copies of Tukhvek, he writes a commentary which takes 113 folios. Like this is the detail he gets into and he doesn't stay with the words, uh, vocabulary Shahidi presents, but goes to places to add synonyms, homonyms, and all the discussions of other his predecessors like getting into, first of all, this is not a teaching text. It is like, it requires a basic knowledge of Persian because he doesn't translate the Persian uh, couplets, but uh, he just presents them as shabak, like as evidentiary uh, sources to understand a particular use of a word. Uh, and uh, so he, as I mentioned, uh, provides around 1500 verses for, from 144 poets, some of them unnamed, but very few. And um, uh, like this is for, uh, I think around 60 vocabulary in 10 couplets that uh, Shahidi provides. Shahidi talks about 60 words and then uh, Baghdadi comes up with 1500 verses to explore like about the homonyms, synonyms of the words included. So uh, I'm looking more analytically, I am trying to read uh, this uh, Baghdadi's text. And uh, what interests me, as I mentioned, like I'm, uh, my comment uh, a bit ago, like I'm, I'm more interested about this individual and his interest in this Shavahit genre, which he displayed in lar large number of texts about different uh, things from Kalam, uh, texts, uh, Shafi's uh, text, he uh, provided glosses for the Shavahit in uh, the Hashiyas of this text by Astrabadi, etc. So he has a lot of intellectual output without having, uh, at least his positions are not mentioned, uh, but he was very mobile, uh, as I mentioned, that, that Damascus, Cairo, Istanbul, back to Cairo, and I stay kind of a thing. Uh, and I think uh, I can read the conclusion, like, mm, like Aslan and I uh, would like to emphasize the importance of a close study of Tufei Shahidi and commenter commentaries on it as a path to understanding philological and ontological uh, methodologies developed by authors with different backgrounds in the Ottoman Empire in Turkish, starting in the 16th century. These endeavors on the path of philology were not solely limited to understanding Persian, Arabic, or other non-Turkic languages. They also established a site for a shared understanding of Rumi canon and eloquence as a constantly challenged, reconsidered, and reshaped identity, in a sense defined by Turkish. Uh, however much it is inflected by Arabic and Persian high literary languages. And when I say Turkish, I'm talking about a particular form of Turkish. Thank you. Oh, one more thing, Mariana was a part of the early, like the Tufe experience from Serbia, from an attic. <laughs> I yeah, the COVID learning. <laughs> well, next COVID. up we have uh, Dr. Mariana Misevic from the Institute of History in Belgrade. Mm -hmm. And the title of the talk is 
curating the makers, the markers of the South Slavic possibilities of Ottoman multilingualism. Welcome virtually. Uh, hello, greetings to everyone from Vienna. I tried to share my screen. I hope I managed. Yeah, we yeah. see. Yes, before I start, I'd like to uh, thank all the distinguished colleagues for their presentations and those who will present and Ferenc, of course, for inviting me uh, to present here. And I'll start immediately and begin this talk by unpacking the title uh, as well as some concepts I will use and or promote here. In this way, I will introduce a few questions related to historical language and literacy ideologies as both methodological tools and objects of inquiry. After that, I will present in broad strokes a small collection of Arabographic manuscripts today preserved and forgotten in a local museum in southwestern Serbia as a marker of the South Slavic possibilities of Ottoman multilingualism. A brief historical introduction, which informs my title, can be formulated as follows. The Turkophone Muslim House of Osman started building its state, which lasted from circa 1300 until 1926, on the expense of the neighboring Anatolian principalities governed by Turkophone Muslim dynasties, as well as through conquests in the frontier regions of Byzantine Empire, whose Christian elites spoke and wrote in Greek for centuries before. Around the mid 14th century, the members of the House of Osman and those loyal to their politics moved to Europe where they, among other, continued marching in predominantly Christian South Slavia, a dialect continuum divided by independent and semi-independent polities. In the late medieval period, South Slavia was already one of the densest political, religious and linguistic contact zones in Europe. With gradual Ottoman conquests followed by the introduction of specific political and administrative practices, it also became a space of the encounter between two different explicitly discursively or implicitly practically constituted language or literacy regimes. The one which regulated the interaction among Latin, altered Slavic and Greek, which were written in three different scripts, and the one whose touchstone can be defined by a usage of the Arabic script for recording the interacting Arabic, Persian, and Western Old Turkish, Turkic. How does described encounter unfolded in both time and space is a question which arguably remains open in the context of the relationship among languages, cultures, and power. Literate and literary culture of the Ottoman polity in its various historical incarnations, late medieval, early modern, pre-modern, has now been routinely quoted as contributing to trans-regional Eurasian complexes described based on the often predefined ideas about language or languages of the textual corpuses feeding into those complexes. Thus, we all know what is meant by Persephone, Arabic cosmopolis, Turkic world, Islamic and literary culture, ba Balkans to Bengal, etc. From the perspective of a historian of the early modern Ottoman society, who acknowledges the ontological assumption that language literacy, their mutual relationship and their respective historical actualizations shaped and were shaped by the socio-political circumstances, the just mentioned scholarly constructs are first and foremost useful for understanding the trans-regional, trans-temporal trajectories of texts which were composed by literate elites in Arabic, Persian and Turkish, and which for a shorter or longer while functioned within the Ottoman society. At this point, we can also remember, for example, that historians of the Ottoman state postulated something called Ottoman Turkish, whereby Ottoman Arabic and Ottoman Persian have not been conceptualized. There is no reason, however, why we should not ask whether some historical texts in say Ottoman Arabic were produced by having in mind local audience, which was expected to act exclusively within the specifically Ottoman language or literacy regime. Finally, it goes without saying that texts in Turkish, Arabic, and Persian have circulated and or have been produced in the Ottoman ruled South Slavia as of at least 15th century until today. In acknowledgement of this fact, this contact zone has been 
also routinely included into the various mentioned trans-regional complexes, though not as such, but under the anachronistic category of the Balkans. Pedantry left aside, the problem with this routine is that it has not occurred in scholarly discourse as a result of a systematic empirical research. Moreover, this routine is not even based on any attempt at systematization of what has so far been achieved by South Slavic Oriental philologists, who, as you may guess, mainly wrote in Slavic. South Slavic speakers who lived within the confines of the Ottoman state and who produced texts in scripts other than the Arabic one are commonly viewed as belonging to Slavdom, which is another construct of a Eurasian scale on the one hand. On the other hand, they are viewed as contributors to respective national cultures and literatures which somehow existed in medieval and modern times, but not in between. South Slavic viewed from within the Ottoman Empire thus comes in two basic arts. As already hinted, widespread is the idea that Ottoman conquests interrupted the quote unquote natural literary, literary and cultural flourishing of the various national languages of South Slavia. In consequence, modern South Slavists essentially operate as medievalists dealing with, lit with literary cultures whose agents awaited the 19th century to get rid of the Turkish yoke before jumping into forced vernacularization and modernity. The ways in which respective monolingual cultures, if we but theoretically allowed they existed, constituted or were affected by the Ottoman language regime are most often reduced to the single aspect of suppression. Unless we count the yoke metaphor, the modes and discursive articulations of this suppression remain pretty unclear. A different view from within the Ottoman Empire resulted in the construction of both written and spoken South Slavic as in essence and in consequence, the language of the Ottoman Christians. The so far mentioned scholar, scholarly constructs prove quite inadequate when we move the focus from large scale cultural complexes to socio-politically situated written manifestations of individual or group linguistic awareness and to linguistic choices operative in the various domains of communication within the Ottoman polity. Simply put, the existing nomenclature fails us when we move to the micro scale analysis of Ottoman arabographic texts and interpretive communities, namely when we realize that, <coughs> pardon, in contrast to various forms of polyglotism, monolingualism of a literate person or a group is impossible to prove. The scholarly constructs mentioned so far are characteristic for approaches which operate with the concept of culture. The concept of culture implies some form of initial uniformity, even when there is a will to analytically transcend its boundaries in search for the realms of transfers, exchange, etc. Historical ling language ideology, however, as analytical device starts with diversity and where and if allowed by sources, moves on to identify uniform patterns, their socio-spatial scope, and the ways in which they fed into separate or shared cultures. As such, it stands in contrast with frameworks based on culture as a concept, but serving similar epistemic goals, it complements them in a dialogical manner. Now, if it was feasible to postulate such a thing as a specifically Ottoman multilingualism, and thereby its history in any analytically significant manner, it would probably be done by, by now. But, this has not been the case, perhaps due to the fact that de facto multilingualism in the Ottoman Empire at the level of the written culture only was formidable. What we can do, however, is to use the words of Barbara Fleming as inspiration, is study the specific possibilities of the Ottoman multilingualism. And one may add at the level of an individual, a group and or space defined both geographically and discursively. Then we can go on and reconstruct the patterns of language use in the context defined by the available information about literacy and socio-political events, rather than our own language ideologies and biases. Arguably, and taking the advice of another historian of Ottoman literature, Walter Andrews, 
we need to start over again. This cannot be done, but by adding to the pool of the existing constructs. Based on what we know about historical demography of Ottoman polity, we can safely say that speakers of South Slavic languages and dialects represent an example of a broader speech community, which was in this or the other way exposed to, governed and engaged by the Ottoman Arabographia for several centuries. By Ottoman Arabographia, I mean the practice of recording texts in the Arabic script during the existence of the Ottoman state, as well as the very corpuses of pragmatic and literary texts produced in this way. Texts written in Slavic by the use of the Arabic script are one of the most obvious formal results of the encounter, the history of which I like to focus on in my work. An Arabographic quadrilingualism involving Arabic, Persian, Turkish, and South Slavic, I suggest, can be postulated as a South Slavic possibility of Ottoman multilingualism, which shared with or diverged from other combinations in ways which are yet to be examined. Nevertheless, a more urgent question that opens at this point is how are we to detect, describe, and delineate this possibility? A logical place to start with is Arabographic texts or collections of texts which can be brought into connection with the geolinguistic space of South Slavia, in which from all we know, Slavic dominated as a spoken language. Most of these collections are well known, and until recently, I myself thought, and, and still do actually, that there is not much new to discover. I was nevertheless happy and excited when I learned that I will have a chance to see some 90 uncatalogued manuscripts preserved in the museum in Užice, a regional center in southwestern Serbia. The guardians of the collection insightfully referred to, to it as Turkish books, and they hoped I could help them find, for example, some fetvas about Užice. Equipped with some experience from other Balkan collections and with some ideas about the Arabographic textscapes of the Ottoman ruled South Slavia, I myself had different, relatively clear expectations. In what follows, I will summarize these expectations and juxtapose them to what I actually found. Sorry, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, loud okay, so, so I, I hear no voice, so I felt alone here. Uh, so one, uh, I expected, I'll go to next slide. Um, I expected to find Arabographic texts composed in Arabic and Persian before the inception of the Ottoman state and mobilized within the Ottoman ruled South Slavia by means of purchase, bequeathing, and or copying. I, I wrote here just two examples so you know, uh, how they fit the definition. The answer is yes for Arabic and no for Persian. Second, I expected to find Arabographic texts in Arabic, Persian, and Turkish, which resulted from literacy events, which took place within or beyond the confines of the Ottoman language regime, and which were also mobilized with, within the Ottoman ruled South Slavia by means of purchase, bequeathing, and or copying. And the an answer here is also yes. In this section, Arabic and Turkish were dominant, whereby Persian was poorly, but indicatively represented in the form of a Turkish commentary of Persian poetry from the 17th century. And of course, Tufay Shahidi, and of course, uh, Birgivi uh, for Ottomanists. Uh, Ottomanists will know what I mean by, of course. <laughs> Three. I also expected to find some Arabographic texts or fragments of Arabographic texts in Slavic. I did not find any freestanding texts, but I did find some fragments, and this under condition that uh, we uh, adopt a very flexible and broad understanding of a text, which uh, I highlighted here in red, and I do normally adopt this broad understanding of text, including uh, more fans, for instance. For 
I also expected to find some Arabographic texts composed or produced by literate people from Ujice, the town in which the collection was uh, is uh, preserved today. And the answer here is uh, yes and no. And uh, this uh, stems from the the the, the ambiguity is uh, comes from the a fact that we are not always sure what from means uh, and uh, the fact that somebody called themselves Ujicevi, for instance, does not mean that they lived in this uh, town. Uh, I only found one copist of a text uh, who marked himself as being a person from Ujice, but uh, this Ali Hafiz was most probably writing or copying in Bosnia. Five, uh, I expected also to find something I like to define as creative arabographic texts, which can be related to the geolinguistic space of the Ottoman rule South Slavia. And this in two ways, through biographies of the original composers and through elements or of contents which address the local realities. The answer to this is no, but this answer can be explained by the provenance of the collection. Namely, this collection was formed uh, when the museum uh, bought or just received uh, old manuscripts and books from people from Nova Varos, Priboj, Priepolje, Zvornik, Bielopolje, Pljevlja, and Novi Pazar. Uh, all of these places are described in, uh, maybe you heard about them for the first time, but uh, they're described in Evlia Chilebi, if you're interested. Uh, all of these places that I just uh, mentioned uh, remained un under the Ottoman rule until 1912, uh, that's the first Balkan Wars, whereby a literate people from Užice, who was actually a very uh, flourishing town during the Ottoman times, uh, were left the town uh, and the last contingent left uh, around 1862 in an organized way. And of those, uh, I, of those literate people from Ujic, I, I will just mention the first one because the timing is interesting. And that is uh, Muslikudin, uh, the first known one, Muslikudin of Ujice, uh, the famous Helveti Sheikh who died in uh, 1642. And later on, we have uh, some poets who, who are well known, as I said, within the uh, Yugoslav Orientalist tradition, but not so much beyond. In the sixth place, and I'm finishing here, I expected to find creative compilations of texts in various languages, more or less indicative of the local realities and the ways in which the functions of respective languages overlapped or complemented one another. And the answer to this is, yes, of course, uh, these uh, compilations or medjmas are ubiquitous, they can be found everywhere. And here I will finish by briefly summarizing some initial impressions we gain about the known producers and users of these texts. The compilations and the whole collection tells us something about people who lived in the closing phase of the encounter, which I tried to emphasize here. Many producers and certainly the last users of these texts lived in the area where Slavic was dominating as a spoken language, which was probably the case throughout the early modern period. Their times, however, were turbulent and characteristic for, if not complete abolition, then suppression and privatization of institutions which perpetuated autobiographic written tradition. In these manuscripts, we can find names of some literate people who are not known as remarkable historical figures but even the producers of the collections of recipes for whatever, including narcotics, prayers for special and all occasions, were probably among the most literate people in the area they lived in at the, in their times. And their influence on the lives of local people, irrespective of confession, was significant, at the least. Further, the people we can imagine based on these texts read the instructions for correct way of praying in Turkish, but they mainly prayed in Arabic. This was the language many of them probably never heard spoken as a mother tongue, but they did have books in which each and every sound of Arabic was described in detail. 
For some of these people, religion and superstition walk hand in hand. In all, they lived in a multilingual universe. And of course, each of them was an owner of a biography at which we can take a glimpse by examining the written record they left behind. Thank you for your attention. Our third panelist, Neil Shafir from University of California, San Diego. And the title of his talk is Paneri? Yeah. Uh, Tongues Learning Turkish on the Edge of Empire. Give my song. Can I have a microphone so that people can? Okay. <laughs> Hey, can everyone hear me on Zoom? Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry, Nir, maybe uh, if you can also turn on your video, it would be nice like, like Professor Kuru to see you closely. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, thank you everyone. And um, thank you, of course, to Ferenc for the invitation to this wonderful conference. Uh, he told me way back in fall or something, a summer inviting me to this, and I was very excited. Um, partially because I hope this will be, to some of you, the topic of a, a second book or a second project. And I've been very inspired by many of the people here, my Alexander, Michael, and Niall, and uh, so many others, and I met so many wonderful people over the course of this weekend. So um, this is, a talk, uh, partially, I mean, based off of an article that I published somewhat recently in uh, Oriente Moderno. And uh, I never got a chance to present it or to talk about it with anyone because it was during the pandemic and it was something my wife asked me to uh, write quickly for a special volume and I did. Uh, and it fit uh, very closely with a bunch of other stuff that me and uh, Aslan Gurkizan, who uh, you heard presented through <laughs> Selly, uh, had been working on ourselves, we actually have a special issue coming out in uh, Tursica in the fall uh, on the social history of Ottoman languages. It came from the basis of um, a mini conference that we had at the Turkelagen Park in uh, Bamberg a few years ago, right before the um, in pandemic. And, um, and you can see three of those papers, uh, all very excellent uh, in the fall. But as I said, this is hopefully going to be the basis of a future project, um, a one on the history of, so, okay. The larger project, in some ways, again, is this, this question that most of us have been tackling with here, which is what were the uses and means of, of language in the early modern Middle East? Ultimately, what kind of political and cultural, intellectual, or religious communities did it create? Um, and how did Middle Easterners themselves uh, conceive of, of language, of its powers, of its uh, as a system of signification, et cetera? And here, I'm always grateful to Alex, uh, both Alex's, for uh, their, their contributions here. And the reigning model, so far, at least for the early modern, is, is this idea of Persian, which is often counted, I think, put forward as a response to uh, visions of language, uh, nationalism as a language ideology, right? So to the degree that the Persianate is, um, you know, it's a vision of early modern language in which it's an open community, which anyone can join in and anyone, if they're properly educated and they can speak Persian, they can become part of it. And I ultimately think that um, because we cast it as a sort of mirror image of nationalism, we kind of lose sight of all the different not necessarily limits, but uh, not even hierarchies, but incapacities for people to enter and to jump and to move around in languages and the very sometimes strict boundaries um, that occur when language is developed. Um, and I think we also have to, have to move into actually looking at how people learn languages, engage with languages rather than you know see them on text as identity markers, et cetera. 
So for me, the way I do this, uh, I've been interested in is kind of a, a question of what is the social history or cultural history of Turkish in the early modern period? And Turkish is an interesting example because in the Ottoman Empire, um, it was one of kind of the three main educated languages for Muslims, right? Arabic and Persian being the other ones. Uh, but Turkish was really the language of politics, right? If an order came out that was in Turkish, uh, if you had to discuss things with officials, it was in Turkish. Um, if you, and they also was language of the court and poetry, et cetera. Um, but what's interesting about Turkish is that, you know, how would anyone actually learn Turkish? Because it wasn't formally taught. There are no formal grammars of it. There's no, until the 19th century, there's absolutely no way for you to, uh, to go back to Michael's presentation, uh, to learn it through uh, any sort of textbook. Um, so how did people get it? Well, for um, native speakers and people who end up becoming part of the bureaucracy and the government, it was you know, often done in the same way that people in the United States learn English prose well uh, today, which is just through imitation and by reading good writing. Um, and in this case, the way that people learned, Muslims would learn to speak Turkish eloquently and well, if they're native speakers, is to read things like the, uh, you know, uh, Turkish commentaries on the on Saadis Gulistan uh, and other uh, pieces like that, which formed the basis of, uh, of this uh, information. But what if you were not Muslim? What if you weren't easily in these, um, let's say, medlises or salons in which you could meet people and discuss poetry and inculcate yourself in Turkish? How did you actually learn it? Well, if you were a non-native speaker, you had a more difficulty doing this. And uh, if you look textually what people were using, you find a lot of stuff like this, uh, basically word lists, glossaries on the right is a piece of, uh, it's a Turkish Arabic glossary in Hebrew characters uh, by Jewish merchant. On the left is the only example of anyone trying to do uh, a formal grammar of Turkish in the Arabic uh, genre of grammar. Uh, again, from uh, mid 17th century Cairo, Cairo being this important site of um, interaction and, and one of my uh, major uh, interests, uh, the Rumi community there. Um, and for the most part, though, if you these word lists don't really do much. They just give you things like um, being able to, you know, uh, like let's go or uh, words and for the marketplace or for the military. Um, they didn't really give you any capacity to go beyond, let's say, transactional Turkish, marketplace Turkish, etc. Um, how did these non-native speakers ever manage to uh, become eloquent or learn the bureaucratic language or engage with it? Um, and I think this was actually a very difficult um, aspect. So you have all sorts of, for example, even within the Ottoman Empire, Armenian, the Greek speaking Turkish every day, uh, but never really rising to the level uh, beyond the street level. That is, they never get to the high level of formal or smallma uh, or smallma jump. And this is why I was always interested in texts that do attempt to try to teach Turkish. And one of the ones I found was uh, one that I described uh, from 17th century Cairo. Another one, though, is this weird text called Bename uh, Havariyun, Beruj Finun, which is in the name of the apostles, houses, or zodiacs of the arts. And it was written by, uh, or co written by a man named Constantine Mavrokordatus, who was the, the first kind of Venerian prince of Valachia, uh, and an unnamed secretary. And the whole point of this book, at least according to his introduction, which uh, explain later is to teach Turkish to his younger brother, his fraternal brother Alexander. Now Alexander actually knows Turkish to some degree, so he studied some books of various languages. But now I need to learn Turkish through selected stories and sage advice and points. And then it does something very weird. It basically uh, creates twelve play-like dialogues, uh, play-like in that they're actually lines of dialogue back and forth, uh, which give different comic scenarios. Uh, and that is supposed to be how it's supposed to teach language. Uh, from this, obviously, you cannot get to any grammar. It's not aiming to teach you grammar. It's not even aiming to teach uh, anyone how to use the basics of Turkish. It's really teaching something else. And, and as I argue, it's really about the power of language and about how to assimilate yourself 
into the high bureaucracy of the Ottoman Empire and to ultimately show that you were in some ways a Muslim um, through your choice of language. Um, and here's the author uh, from a engraving from uh, in the mid 18th century. Uh, Constantine Mavakr Korchatos didn't write anything else that we know of, um, but he was uh, basically a Fenary prince. I'll talk about who they are in just a second. And he was raised in Valachia, basically Bucharest. Um, and he became one of the most powerful and long standing governors of, of Valachia and the other place, Moldovia. Um, and he takes over his position, he gains his position because of his father, Nicholas Mavrokodatus. Um, after his father dies, he's briefly ejected during a big rebellion, which you can touch upon. And then he manages to come back and then rule for about on and off for another 30, 40 years. Um, his father was this guy, Nicholas Mavrokodatus, who in a sense um, managed to establish the rule of the family and of the Venerians in general, um, in Valachia, in what's today basically the southern part of Romania. Um, and he transferred from basically from his office of Chief Dragoman to Voivoda, to the governor. Um, he's also probably better known as a writer. Um, he was the writer of a number of works that have been signaled as the start of the Greek Enlightenment. Uh, this one on the left is Peri Katakon Tan Diblos, which is actually a book on natural law uh, that he wrote while imprisoned by the Habsburgs, um, kind of on the, near the border of Hungary. Uh, he also wrote an interesting sort of what's considered to be the first novel in Greek and possibly in the Ottoman Empire uh, called Pilotheo uh, Pererga. Uh, which is sort of his imagined explorations of Istanbul. Um, and he wrote a whole bunch of other stuff, things about tobacco and other things. And he built churches all, all over uh, this territory of, of Wallachia. Uh, but let's back up. Who are the Venariots? Uh, Nicholas and his son Constantine and um, others for the remainder of the 18th and early 19th century are basically part of a commercial elite of Grecophone families in the 18th century Ottoman Empire. Um, the name Fenariots are, comes from the Spener quarter in Istanbul where they, they originally were and their mansions. Um, and as I pointed out, they're often known as the progenitors of the Greek Enlightenment or Greek nationalists among Romanians are known as uh, oppressors who uh, destroyed the Romanian nation and kept them down. Uh, but as Christine Filio has shown in her, in her book, you know, they are part and parcel of Ottoman governance. And why is that? Because after the Ottomans lose uh, disastrously in Vienna and then are defeated again in the Battle of Zenta in 1697, the Ottomans end up in 1699 in the Treaty of Karlovitz, giving up for the first time areas of, of their empire, uh, or at least on, the, on this border. They give up essentially Hungary and um, Serbia. Um, and then the border gets redrawn and the Ottomans decide that Moldovia and Wallachia, which have been vassal states kind of ruled by uh, uh, a picked Romanian uh, boyar, uh, are going to be ruled sort of directly. And they turn to essentially a group of Greek recophone uh, merchant elites, these Venerian families, to essentially rule. And after the Mavrokodatus family, after Nicholas, he becomes the, the, these areas are ruled by these. Uh, Venaria families for about a hundred years until the Greek revolt of 1822. Um, and what's interesting is that they managed to basically become part of imperial governance. They do everything, all their internal documents are in Greek, they write in Greek, they do things, uh, but they have to engage in uh, Turkish. And in some ways, the Venarians were really on the only non Muslims who are directly employed as uh, secretaries and governors uh, in the Ottoman government. Um, they have to engage with Turkish. And in fact, they do. They end up later on also even translating histories and things like that. Uh, if we look at their actual poetry and so forth, we find out that they uh, 
appreciate Turkish poetry. It's in their songs, and, 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 and they even integrate into Greek chronicles whole sections of Firavans. So they're obviously, one, on one hand, operating at a very high level of Turkish and are involved in the government, and they're specifically part of the, the bureaucracy. Um, and they're not just the translators, the dragomans, they are specifically you know, governors of this region. And this is in some ways, because they're the rare exception, I think this makes them an interesting case or a comparison to the Mughal case where you have actually many, as far as I know, many uh, Hindu munshis fully engaged in a Persian bone environment, uh, writing Persian poetry, completing divans, uh, fully part of the Mughal bureaucratic core. Um, and the, the narratives are basically a bit different. One, they're, one, they're the exceptions and the only non-Muslims in there. But two is that they also don't fully engage with Turkish. They never produce poetry. Um, they don't, other than the translations that are ordered by the government, they don't actually uh, write material in Turkish. The only exception to this is it, it's this book uh, in the name of the apostles that I was I came across. So I don't want to dwell too long on this, but you can ask more like, you know, how did they actually engage with Turkish? What did they know about Turkish? I think some of, as I pointed out, they, they knew to speak Turkish. Getting to the bureaucratic level of Turkish was much more difficult, especially once they moved over, they started ruling from Valachia and Moldavia, uh, where they just weren't around Turkish speakers normally. Um, often, I think they relied on essentially a Muslim chief secretary, what they called the Divan Kapidi, and uh, also these lieutenants that they would send out to their offices in Istanbul and elsewhere, the Kapu Kahya. Um, I think these Muslim chief secretaries actually have even Grecophone, uh, and so they were able to move between these two spaces. Um, but this doesn't mean that they were completely incapable of engaging with Islamic uh, information or text, et cetera. And in fact, um, Nicholas, when he, as he was training his son to kind of take over his position, he actually uh, gifted this gigantic library, mostly of Greek and Latin texts, but also including a, a small, about 20, 30 uh, texts in Turkish, Arabic, and Persian. Um, and if you were to look at what they actually are, um, just I did this with my imperfect capacity to read the Greek alphabet along with the help of uh, a few friends. Um, what you actually see is a variety of things. You know, you have your kind of Greek psalters and things in Greek Arabic liturgies, et cetera. Uh, but what you really have here is a library of a bureaucrat. Um, you know, this is not the library of someone, of a generic library in the Ottoman Empire it has no legal works, really. You have some Hazali at the bottom here. But other than that, you really have uh, texts that were being written and produced by the bureaucrats, the part of this rising Kalemia branch of the Ottoman government in the 17th century. And there's two books here that I want to highlight that I think really give this away. One is this Inshai Rami. Uh, Rami uh, is Rami Mehmed Pasha. And this is a very rare book. There's only one or two copies of it left today. Um, he is the first, the Rais of Kutabi is the first um, Kiatib secretary to rise to the position of, of Grand Vizier. Um, and as Ekin Tushal and others have shown that, you know, this signifies uh, essentially, the re uh, let's say in the entrance of the captives of the bureaucrats into political power in this part of this reinvention of the, the separation of um, bureaucrats from the general uh, world of uh, or as a separate learning and institutional space. Um, the other one. Here is this Hayriya Nabi is a very long mess. Maybe it's probably one of the most popular books of the 18th century. It, it, essentially, in the libraries of every bureaucrat possible, um, it's an advice book, but it tells you basically what to learn, how to be, and everything like that. Um, and it Nabi was actually Rami's tutor of sorts. He was his patron and tutor. Uh, he was also a bureaucrat and poet in the city of Urfa. Uh, but this basically sets up the the moral gives you moral instruction for the, the new bureaucrat class. And for Nabi, everyone in the Ottoman Empire is corrupt except for the chief, the Hajigan and Divan, the chief bureaucrats, the bureau chiefs who are the epitome of learning and governance. So what this situates 
these um, Christians, these denarius, is in a very specific part of Ottoman culture and society, which is this Kalenia branch. Um, now that maybe we know this, uh, I think we can kind of move on to some of the, the text itself and these kind of 12 comic scenarios. The, the whole point of this text is essentially to give to some degree moral instruction. Uh, you know, you're not supposed to gossip, you shouldn't drink too much, you shouldn't, um, uh, you know, avoid hypocrisy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but really the main point of all these scenes is um, the power of language, the, the, the necessity of language to uh, overpower and get out of all situations. And this sets up in a courtroom drama, which was titled, uh, Two Adversaries in the Presence of the Chief Military, Military Magistrate of Romelia, the Acceptance of the Testimony of the Light Gentlemen and the Rejection of Impertinent Men. Um, without going into the details, basically it's about a fight between a creditor and a debtor. debtor. The guy who owns has a debt to, to the other man says that um, he doesn't, he's suing his creditor because he says that he gave him a bunch of jewelry uh, as a sort of surety against his debts. Um, the creditor says, no, you never gave me that jewelry. This is just an elaborate excuse to like get out of paying me my money. Anyways, they now kind of take up their cause in front of the judge. Um, the debtor ultimately gives this very eloquent speech about how he came from Kaiseri and he was poor and he managed to uh, become the, uh, and that he puts himself forward and that justice of the court and he just wants to express himself, et cetera, et cetera. But he does it in such an urbane and sophisticated manner that he is automatically believed. Whereas the debtor who, in, as the scenario makes clear, is actually the one who is being cheated and is uh, the one in the right, uh, just says, you know, he's rough and he's the same as all of his speech directly. He tries to make jokes and it doesn't go over well. Uh, and then ultimately the judge sides with the creditor, even though the creditor, um, provides a false witness. So he says, uh, although the first witness was a false witness because he was urbane, skilled, and able to say the right words, his testimony was accepted and recorded. The second witness was angry, had a sharp temper, and spoke his mind. Thus, although he was a jurist and learned, he was rejected and defeated. Um, and so this goes back, I mean, to the kind of the theme of basically this entire work, which is uh, what should be said versus what we want to say, so Ifade Maram versus Ifade Hakeh Kalam. Um, and it goes on and on and does this in various different ways. There's, um, you know, scenes set in the Basid Chancellery and there's scenes set in the reign of Murat IV in the 17th century and all this other stuff. Uh, but one of the things that you notice as you read the book is basically all the characters are Muslim. Um, you know, they're Sufi sheikhs and they're bureaucrats and they're other people, but they're, there's not one Christian in this, although in the beginning, it's very explicitly declared that the author is Christian. It starts off with that, out of the, the idea for the book, according to the author, start from a heavy drinking session in which they decide to, after getting very drunk, to write a book about learning Turkish. Um, and so it's a weird scene. Well, well what, what is all this supposed to be for? And then you have these uh, scenes like this in which uh, someone reminiscent of certain karagos or puppet theater uh, plays, you have people uh, chastising each other for drinking or for drinking alcohol. So for example, this is an example of one of the dialogues. Uh, the friend who's an alcoholic uh, is being chastised by his friend who's worried about his drinking. So it says, why does my desire to have some good wine to drive my troubles away necessarily cause me to abandon my religious duties? Friend responds, desiring forbidden things is to choose sin and to abandon one's religious duties. When I'm with my jamaat, that here means buddies rather than congregation, from time to time stumbling about as I get up to perform my prayers, is that not a perfect execution of my religious duties? I said, it's an act outside of the place of worship. It goes against the noble verse of the Quran. Do not come anywhere near prayer if you're not intoxicated. But my friend, I can't really be true to myself if I don't drink. What's the cure for these troubles? So why is this author kind of going through all this? And I think part of it, what's going on here is an act of, of mimicry. It's very clear to the readers that this author is Christian. Um, and as I show in the article that all the readers are actually Muslim. Um, and mimicry here to borrow from Homi Baba, um, uh, not a place I thought it would 
Balfram, but he would um, define mimicry in a useful way, you know, a subject of a difference that is almost the same, but not quite. Mimicry is constituted around an ambivalence. In order to be effective, mimicry must continuously produce its lipids, its expert, its difference. And this is, in a sense, what you see here, like there's a very almost weird uh, sense of you're reading a text that uh, for most authors is written by a Christian, but then is uh, all of a sudden um, trying to depict Muslim life or Muslim situations uh, in different ways. Um, and we get this, I think, in some ways most clearly in, in this weird scene about um, what is a chelidi. So a chelidi, for those of you that know, uh, is essentially a learned title of respect. It's supposed to be for any sort of learned person. Uh, in the 17th century, it's often given sometimes for people who derive education outside of the madrasa context. Um, and it's also, at that moment, also something taken up by non-Muslims, especially by rich Christians and Jews, uh, to you know, signify respect for them. And here, the author is essentially giving this vision in a sense he's, he's playing on this uh, this notion so let me just read it out why would you stare publicly on the divan yellow in front of all these people a very respected person like Kadri Fendi, one of the most important secretaries in the imperial office when he learned that I was descended by blood from the line of Eshref Zadeh he called me a Jew I said it would not stand for it and I gave him peace of my mind on the contrary, when he considers you to be like a brother, your father and your father to be like his brother, how could he say that you're a Jew? By God, he said it with that insinuation. In this case, the mirror of insinuation reflects nothing. He ran into you on the street, and after reining his horse and saying hello, he said, Chelebi, why aren't you coming to see us? There you go, I took offense at that word. How very strange. Remember the verse, O King, when it comes to being a Chelebi, there's no place for lineage. Only someone marked by knowledge can be a Chelebi. Putting aside your noble lineage, you're well known personally uh, for being ornamental with Sagasti. He didn't mean Chelebi in that sense. Then what could he have meant? That's all well and good, but nowadays the word Chelebi is one of those words that I hate the most. What does it mean that makes you hate it so much? That big Jew's son, Musa, that's what. That big and small and most of the grandees in the imperial government still call the Jew a Chelebi. So that's what that dirty sneak meant by it. It was not a compliment, but an insult. Uh, then he keeps going on and then they keep insulting each other in different ways. It's a sort of Abbott and Constello type of routine. Um, what's going on here? On one hand, we have, I mean, basically the, the author, Constantine Mavrakodatis, is coming directly from, I mean, you, basically rich Christian merchants uh, who are taking on this role of Chelebi, uh, who are using, they're trying to break into, uh, you know, high 18th century Ottoman Muslim society. At the same time, um, he's making essentially like play-like scenarios in which he is trying to make fun and insult uh, the very kind of non-Muslims who are trying to do so. In this way, I think he's playing on this idea of, of mimicry uh, of, of in this uh, sense of trying to demonstrate that he's both Muslim but also not Muslim. So what was the purpose and audience of this text in, in conclusion, like I think on one hand, the single purpose is just to demonstrate that one only language can bring power. And ultimately it had, I think, two dual audiences. I did think that this was in some ways a language learning manual. It was to some degree very similar to a book that he was using to learn Latin, which is this Loris um, Formula Locendia Terencia Comedius. It's a basically second century uh, book by Terence, uh, which were lines of Latin that people were supposed to memorize. In this case, uh, he was using it to uh, memorize Latin and Greek and French. And that was how they taught Latin and French through lines of dialogue. Um, and I think in some ways he's bringing that notion of dialogue driven textual learning to Turkish. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, is that most of it was actually for imperial bureaucrats. And I can even show and, why in 1730, how he presented to the court and how he ended up getting a job from it. All of the readers of this text that I've found have been uh, essentially high level people in the Kalemia. 
Uh, they've all been Muslim. And I think they found these stories funny. And in fact, uh, this text was eventually printed in the 1850s uh, and it continued to be read as I think a sort of comic genre. So what does all this go back to say about the role of Turkish and Persian and, and so forth is that ultimately I think that it shows just how much effort people had to do to demonstrate, to kind of insert themselves into a high level, it's a space of high level bureaucratic eloquent Turkish. It wasn't even a question. I mean, one, they had to learn the language and demonstrate it, but then to actually be in it, to perform it, to use it, they also had to constantly um, you know, play with the fact that they were uh, non-Muslims, that they were essentially Christians and they were in this Muslim space and they were using Turkish as ultimately a, a Muslim language. Uh, and they were almost um, <clears throat> pointing out, mimic, uh, using mimicry to make light of their, their space and entrance and to enter into that uh, world. Um, and with that, I'll end. Uh, thank you. Our discussion is Dr. Zainab Bukai Kusnu from Wadi University. And after uh, her remarks, we will not have questions and answers. There's no time. So she could uh, go ahead and uh, I don't Food is more important. Okay, I couldn't hear that last part very well, but I did hear the floor is yours. <laughs> okay. Um, First of all, I want to thank all the panelists for their thought-provoking papers. And I also want to thank Ferenc for including me in this cutting edge and very timely conference. Um, I apologize for not having been able to follow as much as I wanted due to the time difference and various commitments, but I'm really looking forward to also the volume and um, um, I'm really happy to, to be a part of this. Um, and I think that uh, the conference together, uh, thought together with numerous recent studies by several of the people here uh, contributes to a significant shift in the field of Middle Eastern and Islamic studies. I want to start just with, with that. Um, first of all, um, literature and language are no longer the, the domain of literary historians only. And as somewhat of a literary historian, this actually makes me happy. We are, uh, uh, first of all, we have I think what, one, one of the things that this conference shows is that we have finally transcended national boundaries as a collective, not in, a, in personal terms. We've had, you know, scholars transcending national boundaries in their per, in their own work, but as a, a as a collective group of scholars, uh, we are actually working in a new paradigm. I think that's that's very important, and we have in that respect transcended uh, also uh, the the um, modern art. Uh, uh, our mo modern preconceptions, not not fully, but uh, some of our modern preconceptions about the uh, about uh, what constitutes literary history and and what uh, what constitutes the material of history. And coming from a literary historian's background, I feel I so it's it's much more precious to be at this point for me. Um, most importantly, we've come to understand the production, copying, circulation, and recitation of any given text in any given context as political acts. I think that's very obvious from uh, what, uh, from all of the research that's brought to, uh, together here. So languages create, delineate, bring together and evolve communities. As also underlined by Mishevich in her paper, languages and literature are not the product of existing cultures. Culture per se becomes a possibility a mental and social category through the work of language and literature. And this conference takes this perspective further in putting the focus on a particular power structure that was at the same time global. How does language make empire and how does empire make language, both on a global scale, I guess Islamic at Eurasia is global enough, but also at the micro level in daily interaction, personal education, um, religious worship, etc. In answering this question, I think the papers in this panel speak to one another particularly well. Uh, I want to start with the theoretical discussion in Misevich's paper. 
Um, Shevich's paper presents, I, I think, a powerful attempt to rethink the current paradigms in the linguist, on the linguistic history of South Slavia in order to establish the Ottoman period not as a gap in the literary histories of national cultures, but as a marker of the multilingual past of the region. Indeed, her attempt to, and I'm quoting here, trace the specific possibilities of Ottoman multilingualism as taken from Barbara Fleming can be considered a common aim for all three papers. Mishevich defines a, a South Slavic possibility of Ottoman multilingualism as, and I'm quoting her, <laughs> an Arabographic quadrilingualism involving Arabic, Persian, Turkish, and South Slavic. Shafir's paper presents yet another possibility of uh, Ottoman multilingualism, one that includes Greek, Latin, uh, French, Italian, and Romanian, just to name a few. I'm also basing myself a little bit on his, on his uh, brilliant article that I just read for, the, uh, for this, so thank you, Nir. Um, uh, in this regard, both papers demonstrate what Mishevich re refers to as an encounter between two different language literacy regimes. And although a broader look lets us define the, these regimes as Muslim versus Christian, both papers show that the local iterations of these language regimes can be significantly different, depending not only on geography, but also on the social identities of the actors, their cultural capital, levels of literacy, and personal aspirations. Uh, in this regard, Nir presents us with a fascinating case study of the Mauro Cordato's family, uh, um, by unpacking the historical context and the rich intertextuality of the text in the name of the apostles by Constantine Mavrokordatos. Here, I, uh, on a micro scale, we have a clear example of what, I, of what I just called language as politics. First of all, in the very purpose of the composition of the text to win back a lost position in the Ottoman state. Secondly, in the very content of the text as a constant negotiation between la different language, um, sorry, <laughs> between different language regimes, yes. And third, in the rich intertextual horizons of the text, which powerfully demonstrate what, what Shafir refers to as the Fenariot's precarious state of in-betweenness. So we also have to think about the encounter between two different language regimes as a precarious state for their actors. Um, coming to uh, Professor uh, Selim Surakuru's uh, uh, talk, um, this is, of course, this project has, I, I think, will have vast repercussions for our understanding of the uh, of the cosmopolitan model of Ottoman literacy, and I think that um, I will elaborate on that a little bit. So, it's uh, um, what does it mean for a 17th century commentary uh, on uh, on the to what does it mean for an Ottoman text, the Tufei Shadi, to be a, a model for Persian learning? So here, if if a per, if, so, I think we this 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 sort of uh, what this does to our understanding of of Persian culture in the local context is to re-elaborate the Ottoman Turkish, first of all, as a cosmopolitan language. Of course, we all three papers demonstrate what uh, that Ottoman Turkish ha was at this point in, in, late, in uh, the early modern context, a cosmopolitan language. But uh, when we have the El Sine y Selase as uh, a model for cosmopolitan learning, we also have a, a, a unique cosmopolitan code that was not based on one language or two languages, but three languages interacting in specific ways in specific contexts. Um, so that I think that allows us to think of another model of cosmopolitanism from the one that, you know, uh, that was put forth by Sheldon Pollock, for instance, where, um, where language, where, where cosmopolitan codes were necessarily uh, related to uh, one language and its spread and its, uh, its local or origins. So in this context, the Persian, uh, the, the use of Persian and Persian culture is not a borrowing or not necessarily no longer a model taken from a model from another geography, but is the in, in, internal, is, is, is part of the internal dynamics of the cosmopolitan code itself. 
and and of course this shows in, in Ms. Shafir's um, example in that local uh, in in that particular context, and it shows in Mishevich's broad uh, portrayal of the manuscripts in a local region where we always have a vision of the uh, of the three languages together even though their, their specific uses can be very different. Uh, now, I want to end uh, on, a, on a note saying that, of course, when we're trying to reconstruct this particular trilingual cosmopolitan code, we, all, we need to understand that this always relates to class, not, not, not and of course, the, the, the locality and, uh, you know, the, the geography aspect of it is obvious from the, the, the variety of the three papers. And I, I think that the relationship to class maybe comes forth most in Shafir's and Kuru's example as, you know, this is a language of bureaucracy and how does that language of bureaucracy then transcend that, that class space into daily life in social interaction? And where do we trace those or, or in prayer as Mariana was talking about? You know how Arabic comes is approached in a very specific context in a very specific way. So when um, so in order to extend beyond um, the uh, the bureaucratic context of our manuscripts that sort of limit us to a certain class. Of course, Professor Cruz laughing because where I always come whenever I talk. How do we extend? beyond the social classes uh, that who have the written, written record into how the cosmopolitan played out uh, outside of the written context, outside of the context of literacy regimes in the oral context of people who had less literacy, limited literacy or no literacy. Um, that's all I want to say and I want to thank everyone. Uh, Uh, should we come back and back at 12 30? Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad that I'm chairing. Uh... Hello, everybody on Zoom. I don't think you can hear me. I hope you can. Can. So my name's Niall Green, and I'm really excited to be uh, chairing introducing this next panel by two scholars whose books are just out and just coming out, but whose work I've been anticipating for, for years and reading as it comes out in articles, and I'm really excited about the books. So our first speaker is Alexander Jabari from the University of Minnesota, and he's going to be telling us about language as an organism. Evolution, ideology, and print culture in Persian and Urdu. Take it away, Alexander. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to try to speak while, while pulling up my slides and getting on the Zoom all at the same time. I'm sort of not wasting time. Sounds like you're not prepared for this. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I'm presenting from today, um, as, as Niall mentioned, is, is my um, my recent book, which just came out um, with Cambridge University Press a couple of months ago. Um, and the book is about uh, intellectual and literary exchange between Iranians and Indians in the 19th and 20th centuries across Persian and Urdu. And, and there I show how intellectuals in Iran and India drew on Persian networks in order to modernize their shared heritage. And the great irony uh, of this kind of cosmopolitan exchange between them is that it helps consolidate in the end nationalism and produce this kind of, you know, uh, Persian modernity, which erases then the traces of that cosmopolitan cooperation that made it possible in the, per in the first place and, and eventually associates the Persian language and, and literature with um, uh, almost exclusively with, with Iran. Um, okay, I can just get on the Zoom. Um, 
at any rate, uh, today I'm going to focus on a very small part of the book um, and make a couple of uh, very simple points actually about uh, the question of language and in particular uh, how the reception of evolutionary theories and Darwinism in the Persian world uh, helped shape um, the help shape how people conceive of, of language. And I do this through looking at the genre, uh, which is a new genre emerging at this, in this time period, 19th, early 20th century of literary history. Um, and that's one of these kind of key sites for making sense of the pre-modern um, lit Persian literary tradition and modernizing it, making it accord with, with modern values um, that these intellectuals come to hold. Um, <clears throat> so the new genre of Persian literary history told the story of uh, Persian language and literature, which is now um, presented as national heritage in Iran and Islamic heritage in India. Yet Iran took center stage even in Indian accounts uh, of Persian literature in this time period, despite India's historic role as a center of Persian literary production. And even as Urdu becomes a new vehicle for the Persian tradition in India, Indian Muslims did not challenge this nationalist logic linking Persian to Iran. Instead, many actively embraced this narrative, even to the extent of tying their own linguistic identity to Iran uh, and elsewhere in the Middle East. And in doing so, they ended up writing themselves out of the story of, uh, of Persian literature uh, and out of belonging to, to India altogether. Okay. Now I'm now I'm on the Zoom. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to um, share my screen and pull up my um, slides. Okay, which there are only a few of them. Anyway. <clears throat> so, given the convergence in Iranians and Indian Muslims' narratives of Persian language, um, in that they they kind of shared this, you know, Iran centrism, it's all the more striking that. Uh, their conceptions of the Persian and Urdu languages differed so radically. And, and by that, I mean the narratives that they constructed about what is our language, where does it come from, what is its history. These end up being like mirror opposites for, for Persian and for Urdu. Okay, so here's, here's the book. Um, I'll come back to that later. Okay. <clears throat> Um, and I'm going to review a bit of history that I think everybody here knows, but for the for the sake of, of making a point, um, the Persian language, uh, as we know it today, was born out of interaction with Arabic and with Islam. Its precursors, you know, language varieties that we now identify as Middle Persian, had been the court language of the Sasanians. Um, but within a couple centuries after the rise of Islam, the language takes on a new identity distinct from the Parsi of the uh, of the Sasanian court with a new Arabic derived script, massive amounts of Arabic loan words, a literature heavily indebted to Arabic forms, meters, and imagery, and a new name, Farsi, um, with that initial F, of course, representing the Arabic pronunciation of the earlier Parsi. Uh, so this new Persian uh, is then patronized by Muslim courts and spread to the Indian subcontinent as a vehicle for Islam. Okay, so this is history we know. Uh, but as Persian becomes a language of power and learning in South Asia, its relationship with language that will later come to be identified as Urdu really mirrors that same rela earlier relationship between Persian and, and Arabic, which is to say that just as so many of the elements that gave new Persian its identity as a language and as a literary tradition were borrowed from another tradition, Arabic, this was also true of Urdu, uh, and the elements that would ultimately constitute Urdu's identity were largely borrowed from Persian, right? Um, the perso arabic script, tens and thousands of Persian words, including that Arabic vocabulary that had entered Persian, uh, literature in perso arabic forms like puzzle poetry and so on. So the historical circumstances uh, of the development of new Persian and the development of Urdu as literary traditions are very similar. Yet modern Iranians and Indians made very different meaning of these historical dynamics. Iranian nationalists conceived of the Persian language in opposition to Arabic. Uh, for them, Persian was part of a continuous Iranian civilization stretching back to antiquity 
encompassing the old Persian of the Achaemenid inscriptions, the middle Persian of the Sasanian court, and the new Persian that followed the rise of Islam. Iranian nationalists like uh, the literary historian and poet Muhammad Tafi Bahar emphasized the continuity of Persian over time, uninterrupted by Arabic, which they saw as belonging to a distinct civilization. So the civilizational paradigm uh, was shaped really by the reception of European philology. 19th century philologists grouped Persian, of course, with the Indo-European, what was, what was coming to be um, understood as the Indo-European family of languages, distinct from Semitic languages like Arabic, and this offers a, a narrative of, of linguistic continuity over time. So just to be clear, my, my argument is not to dispute that philological model on, on linguistic grounds, uh, on the basis of, of accuracy, uh, but to show that its adoption as part of Iranian nationalism was not something that was inevitable. Of course, this is a scientifically accurate uh, way of thinking about language. And so of course, Iranians will come to think in those terms. Um, it's actually something that's historically contingent. And we can see that contingency by looking comparatively at the Indo-Muslim narratives of Urdu. So although Urdu was originally used um, by you know, Hindus, Muslims, many different religious communities, uh, beginning in the 19th century, it comes to increasingly be seen as the language of North Indian Muslims in contrast to Hindi associated with Hindus. And so contrary to this Iranian narrative of continuity kind of before and after Islam, many South Asian Muslims saw rupture and hybridity as key to the story of Urdu's origins. So according to their telling, Urdu begins with the encounter with Islam. That's the starting point. And it's a, it's a point of rupture with what comes from before. Uh, and rather than conceiving of their language in terms of distinction from others, Muslims embraced hybridity regarding Urdu as inherently a melange of languages. And this is a model that's I'm sure familiar to the, the Ottomanists in the room. The idea that Urdu is inherently has, you know, a, a mix of, of Hindi, Persian, Arabic, and, and Turkish. And that narrative is still incredibly popular. And the inclusion of Turkish in this uh, kind of linguistic pedigree for Urdu is actually very telling because the Turkic element in Urdu is extremely small. It's basically negligible. Uh, but by claiming that Urdu is a mix that includes Turkish, this is something that allows Indian Muslims to construct a genealogy that in a way connects them to the Ottoman Empire at a time where um, many Muslims under British rule are longing for this kind of powerful um, caliphate to counter the weakness that they feel as colonized subjects. And indeed, treating Arabic and Persian as separate contributors to Urdu, even though the Arabic elements are borrowed through Persian, is also part of the task of giving Urdu this kind of Muslim pedigree that would connect it to Muslim lands like the Arab world in addition to Iran. Uh, but it's the growing influence of evolutionary theory in the Islamic world that helps make it possible in the first place to conceive of language in this way, that is as a distinct historical entity that develops over time, that has a history and that encounters other discreetly bounded languages. Charles Darwin himself had compared the evolution of species to the evolution of languages in On the Origin of Species and other works contending that, quote, the formation of different languages and of distinct species and the proofs that they have been developed through a gradual process are curiously parallel. Actually, Darwin is first influenced by developments in historical linguistics rather than the other way around. As many 19th century philologists uh, began to conceive of language as a living organism, the impact of natural history works like Darwin's on historical linguistics led to discussion of mixed or hybrid languages as if they're organisms of, of mixed parentage. And the lifespan of an organism uh, with its periods of growth followed by an uh, inevitable eventual decay uh, maps very neatly onto the narrative of literary flourishing and then decline, which is a ubiquitous staple of uh, Persian literary histories and, and not only Persian, like the, the Arabic and Ottoman cases are very similar. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, first Indian Muslims and then Iranians 
uh, began to introduce evolutionary language and metaphors into their new literary histories. Um, and this is something that we can see if we if we read across these um, sort of linguistic and geographic um, boundaries, because they're they're very much responding to reading and, and engaging with one another and kind of um, passing Darwinist ideas between Arabic and then uh, from European languages into Arabic and then into Urdu, Turkish, Persian and, and between them. So the Indian Muslim reformer, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, who we heard about in, in Niall's keynote uh, just briefly uh, yesterday, uh, was perhaps the most you know, pop, uh, prominent popularizer of science uh, in, the, in the subcontinent and advocated naturalist beliefs uh, in the 1880s and 1890s in Urdu. He held Darwinism and Islam to be compatible and advocated a view of human evolution as teleological and, and guided by God. Of course, Jamal ad-Din al-Afghani's polemic against naturalism, uh, written in Persian and then translated into Urdu and, and into Arabic, um, you know, it's something, the debate over kind of naturalism and the natures, uh, as they come to be called polemically, makes the subject into a topic of debate across the Islamic, Islamic world, so that even those who are, who are arguing against and trying to refute Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan end up taking up uh, this framework and, and sort of internalizing it. And this is part of the way, this debate is part of the way the language and metaphors of biological evolution uh, find their way into works on literary history as well. Rather than refuting evolution, many Muslims in South Asia and elsewhere uh, start to argue that the idea has already been articulated in Persian poetry long before Darwin. Uh, for example, the idea that Rumi anticipated the theory of, of evolution in the 13th century uh, was very popular among South Asian Muslims. Um, so here we have a couple of uh, of examples on the left is, uh, is Shibli Numani's uh, biography of, of Rumi in Urdu. This is the first biography in any language, I think, of, uh, of Rumi. And at the very end, um, he cites from the Masnavi and says, okay, and this is an example of, excuse me, where, um, where Rumi is anticipating Darwin, right, you know, centuries earlier. In the same time period, on the, on the right there is um, uh, Said Amir Ali, uh, writing in English, but but quoting in Persian from the Masnavi, actually different lines from the Masnavi to make the same point. Um, uh, as it says there, these notions found expression later in the Masnavi, these notions of, of biological evolution. Uh, and this is not limited to the subcontinent, you know, really across the Persian world, um, you start to have all of these examples of identifying literary figures as proto-evolutionists. Um, Abdullah Jev, uh, Jevdet, the Ottoman intellectual, describes Al-Ma'ari, uh, the, the 11th century Arab poet, as anticipating Darwinism. Uh, the Bukharan reformer, Abdul Rauf Fitrat, takes uh, Bidel, the early 18th century uh, Indo-Persian poet, as someone who had discovered Darwinian evolution. Uh, but these are kind of facile engagements with evolutionary theory, and it's actually the literary historians who engage more seriously with and internalize, um, you know, these, this kind of thinking about uh, evolution. And so Bahar, who I mentioned, um, integrates the evolutionary theories of, of Darwin and of the German materialist uh, Ludwig Buchner into his landmark history of Persian prose, Sapshan Stylistics, and he translates Buchner into, into Persian and argues that factors in language change are the same as those at work in biological evolution, like, as he puts it, uh, natural selection and survival of the fittest. And of course, uh, language here is also being used as a synecdoche for the nation, right? And these are, these are ultimately national histories that use language and literature to, uh, to narrate the, the history of a nation. And Bahar's application of, of Darwinism to literature uh, and to literary history, really, uh, is only the latest in a series of, of developments that precede him. Works like uh, Georgi Zaydan, who we also talked about in his Tarikh al Lugha al Arabiya Ket and Chai, or the Bahar's compatriot, the Iranian uh, Jalaluddin Humayi, in his History of the Literature of Iran. And Humayi states that language is subject to evolution, uh, it represents a nation, Melat, and a race, Nejad. So this kind of Herderian understanding of language and nation uh, and, and the link between them is a fundamental assumption of the genre of literary history. Now, although 
Indians and Iranians both then start to come to see language as something like a living organism, they nevertheless differed in how they conceived of that organism. So Iranians like Bahar and Homayi had a vision of Persian evolving over time, but always retaining its national essence. Uh, whereas Indians uh, like Shibli saw Urdu, uh, as I mentioned, as a hybrid language, something that's entirely new, that's born out of the Indian encounter with Islam. And actually Shibli describes Persian in, in similar terms um, and Persian literature um, as, as born out of the encounter with Islam. So these two different narratives that we have then, uh, on the one hand, Persian continuity and discreteness, and on the other, uh, Urdu narrative of rupture and hybridity, reflect different relationships to Orientalist forms of knowledge about language. Iranian nationalism aligned itself with the new Indo-European philology, reading national history through the lens of linguistics, emphasizing continuity with the pre-Islamic period, and a linear development from old to middle to new Persian. Uh, but British colonialism and Hindu nationalism made such a narrative unavailable to Indian Muslims because the British identified Sanskrit as the classical heritage specifically of the Hindus um, and associated Muslims with Arabic and Persian that came to the subcontinent from elsewhere. Of course, later they'll come to understand Sanskrit may have also come to the subcontinent from elsewhere, but that moment comes a little later. Um, so uh, because of this thinking then, uh, the British situated Hindi and the Hindus as the inheritors of Sanskrit, as the heirs to this enduring indigenous Aryan civilization and positioning Urdu speaking Muslims as foreigners outside, outsiders to India connected to other lands. So they don't have access to that kind of philological model in the way that the Iranians do. Um, and that pernicious idea of course is of Indian Muslims as outsiders continues to be weaponized against them today. Um, so I'll, I'll move towards concluding. Um, what I've presented here is a comparative history, of course, of, of modern linguistic narratives in Persian and Urdu. And at the point of the comparison is that it reveals the contingencies uh, at each step of the way, showing how one could have developed more like the other under different uh, historical circumstances. Um, but I also, um, I'm, I'm you know, presenting this with an eye towards uh, my next project that I'm, I'm very early on in, in thinking about, where I wanna trace this line of inquiry back a little bit further, going at least back to uh, Khan Arzu in the 17th century, if not earlier, in thinking about how languages come to be conceived, how the distinctions between languages come to be conceived of and, and thought of, because it's certainly not, the 19th century is not a starting point for, for thinking about, as, as we've seen in this wonderful conference, uh, the boundaries and, and borders between languages and the interactions between them. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll say here, I didn't really have a, uh, enough time, always too ambitious, um, uh, to address the print culture um, part of the, the title that I'd sent. But I want to say quickly that these different linguistic narratives help explain why Iranians made the switch to uh, NAS with, with the advent of movable type, which of course could only be done in, or could only be done well in NAS, whereas Urdu speakers uh, stuck with Nastaliq, um, which meant that they continued using lithography all the way up until the 80s when you have uh, the invention of uh, digital typefaces for Nastaliq. And it's because um, you have in, in Iran a, a, a national and a linguistic narrative that already encompasses multiple scripts, that already you can conceive of the language as having been written in uh, the Achaemenid, you know, in, in the Pazan script, in the Pahlavi script, in a, in a multiplicity of scripts. And you really have an explosion in this time period of Iranians experimenting with different scripts and new scripts for Persian in a way that's just not true of Urdu because what makes Urdu Urdu, what gives it its linguistic identity to its speakers is the script itself. That's what distinguishes it, for example, or one of the things that distinguishes it from Hindi. So there's a lot less kind of flexibility in thinking about how can you write the language in a way that it will still be kind of true to its essence as, as people are thinking in those terms. Um, so anyway, I, I can say more about that in the, in the Q and A, but I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you.
And our next speaker is Arya Pani of the University of Washington, who will be telling us about literary nationalism and early 20th century Persian periodicals. Thank you. Uh, uh, if I could have, um, which, uh, uh, you would be able to share. Uh, can you try? Why would you just like that? Um, yeah, hang on. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm ready. No. Thanks so much for your help. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um Feliz, thank you so much for including me in this exciting uh conference. Thank you now for being to serve as discussant. It's really good to present with you, my friend and colleague Alexander Jabori, and and um to be in your company. I think you will see all the resonances between our talks uh, put on display so much so that the, the macro narrative that Alexander just provided basically uh, will help you appreciate and understand the, the micro narrative that I'm about to delve into. And so that I don't even have to share any history with you because uh, he just did such a great job of uh, showing the contours of, uh, of this rising national uh, you know, identity. I remember standing timidly in front of my elementary school teacher and he as well struggling to recite Muhammad Taghi Bahar's uh, Damavand Yedo Vomer second ode to Mount Damavand. I had spent the weekend playing in the street instead of doing my homework, which was to memorize the Qasida by the famed constitution era poet and scholar. And the other reason obviously is because I'm not Adhikar Jurabari, just <laughs> Turkish and Arabic and Persian poetry coming out of me. <laughs> a harsh poem, Damovan Dovon, beautifully celebrated Mount Damovan, personifying it as the dome of the world, Gumbadekiti, and a white demon with feathered feet, Diva Sepida Paydarvan, called on by the poet to tear down despotism and hypocrisy. A biographical sketch of Bahar, bearing the title Tarikh Adabiyat, or literary history, appeared above the poem on which students were later quizzed. So this was my first encounter with Bahar, framed as a literary embodiment of Iran's bounded geography, his Damavand shaking the ground from Nishabur to Nahavand. I rediscovered Bahar two decades later in graduate school, having at some point stopped playing in the street. <laughs> this time, I encountered an intellectual who has contributed, contributed immensely to the making of Persian literary nationalism as opposed to the Bahar of my elementary school textbook, a singular figure who eventually acquired uh, Iran's timeless literary pe patrimony. This time, my task was not to recite his verses in celebration of Iran's soaring peaks, but to critically situate his place within, the, uh, within early 20th century networks of civic-minded intellectuals centered on print culture and national identity. I had come full circle by recognizing that without figures like Bahar, the world that made my elementary Adabiyat textbook imaginable would not exist. The term Adabiyat is not invoked here as a timeless or universal notion, which remains a common practice in spite of increasing awareness that literature is not, uh, it, it, that the literature is a modern concept. Beginning in the 19, in 1890s, Persian language intellectuals began to reconfigure the meaning of Adabiyat, then a seldom used plural designation for Adab derived sciences bringing it into close alignment with the 19th century European concepts of literature or literature. In the course of half a century, literature as a modern notion was born, defined as a prized canon of text that embodies the civilizational achievements and national character of a unitary people. This meaning was at odds with adab as aesthetic and ethical form to use Monarchia's recent formulation. Adab was acquired by mobile networks of often male scholars, while Adabiyad was to be consumed by national subjects like myself in classroom settings taught in one language. Adab required speaking beautifully and acting ethically and saying what is beautiful counts as good ethics, while good ethics is by default beautiful. By contrast, Adabiyad qua literature jettisoned ethics, leaving it to the domain of Adab while claiming monopoly over aesthetics. The conceptual realignment of Adabiyata's literature was not the automatic outcome of translating European forms of knowledge into local and national languages. 
It required forming societies where new ideas were discussed and debated in company and conversation. In fact, voluntary associations or anjumans laid the foundation for the making of a new discourse of literature in late Qajar and early Pahlavi Iran. Bahar's seminal study, Sak Shenasi, uh, which was published between 1942 and 1947 in three volumes, commissioned for Iran's inaugural doctoral program in Persian literature at the University of Tehran. And I understand we actually have a graduate, a, a PhD from the University of Tehran, which is such an honor to have you here. Uh, in the mid 1930s has rightly been the focal point of this recent scholarship. Yet focusing on his later works presents two problems. It mutes the historical role played by Anjumans in the formation of Persian literature as a discipline. And in turn, it presents stylistics as a standalone work, as opposed to a byproduct of various conversations and processes. Examining, examining Bahar's writings in the pages of early 20th century periodicals reveals an intellectual cohort working to parse out the categories and taxonomies of a modern literary discipline in the making. So here I will discuss uh, Bahar's uh, uh, pieces in the journal Danish Kadeh, 1918. And if, if, Ferenc, if you could please move on to the next slide. Um, this is the Anjaman meeting in Bahar's house. Uh, I also like to point out that he, like many others in his generation, is wearing a turban, he's a seminarian, uh, uh, well-versed in Arabic. And if you go to the previous picture, you will see him wearing a, a tie and a, and a suit, uh, much like Ali Kharjuravari. And, uh, you know, <laughs> this is because this is how university professors are supposed to dress uh, to, to distinguish them from, from seminarians. And so you, this is one of the many uh, uh, distinctions that uh, modernity secured for itself. And you could go back to the non Ali Kharjura Okay. <laughs> one of Bahar's, like, one of Bahar's widely uh, cited articles in Danish Kare is the influence of milieu on literature, the Tasir Mohit Darbar Adabiyat, in which he linked the development of Persian literature to a host of interlinked elements and nations, quoting. Um, actually, I should really do this in a certain voice. A nation, a people's milieu is defined by, excuse me, a constellation of co-constitutive factors like climate, food, location, and circumstances attributed to a specific locale such as, well, these words wouldn't come out of his mouth. He, you know, he would say, we're looking at a very strong uh, proliferation of religious, scientific, and political thought, historical events, and their consequences, including subjugation, migration, racial mixings. And I think Ferenc is definitely reconsider why he included me in this. The heart then forged a direct link between the nation's history and literature, writing that, quote, a subjugated nation that has had to submit to horrifying and debased effects of subjugation does not have epic and war poetry, end quote. So this type of environmental thinking played a key role in informing German and French nationalisms as well, as evidenced by figures that, you know, figures that Alex quoted, Ludwig Buchner. Bahar sought to explain the political and cultural dominance of Europe through environmental determinism as the, as the main driving force of historical change. More specifically, he attributed Europe's civilizational ascendance to planetary changes that had created, according to him, a climate suitable for the cultivation of such great men as Napoleon, Peter, and Frederick, and uh, more recently, Giorgia Meloni, uh, but that's not him saying that, writing that today, quote, the Europeans are in the same business as we Asians were eight to 5,000 years ago, end quote. He then posed his central question, in what way must our literature today, which is essentially the result of 10 centuries of great revolutions and big changes in Iran's spiritual milieu be modernized? Modernization, he warned, could not be realized through the imitation of Western literature and music deployed an evocative metaphor Wearing his father's big shoes would not turn a child into a grown man. This metaphor had unmistakable resonances of Darwin's idea of evolution and progress, a trend uh, whose gestation Alexander Jabari has recently analyzed in his book. In fact, according to Noel Karini, Loy, and Hak Higuchi, Shibli Shomel's translation of Ludwig uh, Buchner, uh, whose commentary on the origins of species had informed Bahar's understanding of Darwin, 
seminal text. So this is mediated by translation and commentary. And ultimately, Bahar is invoking the idea of milieu as a way of bringing language, literature, and the nation into congruence. Bahar was insistent that abandoning the classical literary heritage in pursuit of modernity was not a viable option, instead outlining a path of incremental change. A moderate approach based on incremental Bahar argued, was effectively the path chosen by his journal, Danish Gadir, quote, to raise new vistas, but only built on the classical foundation of the past, end quote. He argued that Persian literature in its internal and external forms must seek to reform the milieu in which it is composed. For instance, reciting poetry, one must dispel, quote, the superstitions that lie the, and lies that were in, inherited from ignorant teachers cultivated by a defeated and wretched milieu, end quote. New elements must instead replace them in order to familiarize people with the, quote, arts and sciences, physical and mental exercises, perseverance, national pride, lack of concern towards foreigners and appreciation, end quote. At the same time, he continued, quote, we should encourage our government to pursue justice and equity, punish thieves and bandits, establish free of cost male and female schools, equip faithful soldiers, create arms manufacturing factories, this is still him, not Kevin McCarthy, expand the railway system, promote industrialism and trade, and discover sources of wealth, end quote. Briefly put, Bahar viewed literature as a system with the power to mold a people's milieu, affording writers agency to effect societal change and in turn shape their milieu. Gradually, Bahar predicted milieu could change, enabling people to take charge of their own destiny, without having to rely on planetary changes that may otherwise take centuries to, to take place. So the last two assertions show how constantly Bahar oscillated between the determinism of, of the environment and the intellectual power to actively shape it. Bahar de-emphasized race as a factor that shapes literary production. According to him, the spirit of literature, Ruha Adariyat, was determined by a people's milieu and not the racial genius. Like most of his contemporaries, Bahar viewed Iranians as a unitary race and ontological category. Iran for Bahar was the primordial home of an ethnically and culturally distinctive people, and its political stability and strength provided the most suitable milieu for the flourishing of Persian literature in various historical eras. For instance, he flagged the Samanid, Ghaznavid, and Seljuk dominions as environmentally distinct from that of the Mongol Empire for the former, mark Iran's conquests, while the latter mark the subjugation of Iranians. Here one can see that Bahar's idea of milieu maps rather neatly onto the changing political domains of this timeless Iran. While his ideas on the milieu were widely cited by his contemporaries, they would not always carry the same resonance. For instance, Jalaluddin Humayi's The Literary History of Iran, Alex also referenced him, published in 1929, it featured excerpts of Bahar's essay in his preface. He, though, Humayi, emphasized the role of race as an influencing factor in shaping literary history. Humayi inaccurately suggested that Bahar had argued that changes in the milieu lead to facial and muscular differences in people. By contrast, that Humayi attributed it to one's race, uh, um, even, even features like one's singing voice, Humayi argued, had, had to do with race, and ultimately arguing that some races possess an, in, possess an innate sense of intelligence as opposed to other races that lack any intelligence. So you could see that even within the same country, even within the same tradition, within the same institution, there are some fundamental differences that, that emerge. Uh, that is not to say that race thinking, uh, racial thinking is not part of Bahar's uh, idea. He, if I if I have enough time, I will also get to this. Do I do I still have some time? I have to read, I, I, yeah, I think if you're just going to read that, what you have. So, uh, so, so I could monitor my phone. I mean, dictators are usually self-governed. So in the second <laughs> quarter of the 20th century, Bahar and his cohort were searching for a Persian equivalent to best approximate the first the French term steel. Uh, I, I think that's how it's pronounced, the style, in the early 1930s, similar to the use of the term adabiyat in the late 19th century, the meaning of style remained unsettled and context-dependent. 
At times it served as a byword for literary movement, as in the style of classics and romantics. At times it denoted a particular genre like Pasida and Ghazal, while in other instances it broadly referred to features such as syntax, phraseology, or use of rhetorical devices that distinguished a certain type of writing. Why is this significant? Because the, the classification that Bahar offers for, mostly for prose, but mapped onto poetry too, which is the Khurasani, the Iraqi, the Sakhi Hindi style, and of course the, the Bazgash Adabi or the return, which he, he considers to be a unique property of, of Iran, they are absolutely to, to, to a large extent in Iran and academia unquestioned pillars of literary historiography. And here, if we only read stylistics, we fail to see that these categories were so malleable and so unsettled um, that it was only in the 1930s when he really began to forge um, a, a working definition of style, which thanks to Alex's uh, translation of his introduction in the Journal of Persian Literature, is now accessible to people who don't read Persian. Um, and, and I think, I think that's, that's, that's very important uh, to know in, in uh, questioning these heavily mythologized categories that at least in American academia and now thanks to the new generation in Iranian academia are being taken to task. Publishing two issues of Armagan in 1932 and 33, Bahar's essay Bazgash Adabi among the earliest instances of the use of style. In literary return, Bahar sought to understand the history of Persian poetry by identifying major stages of its development mm. by using style as a rubric. And this is where he really introduces this rubric, which in spite of the fact that he, he keeps saying to us that th this has less to do with region and more to do with temporality because Indian poets also composed in the Khorasani style, but it, it still dovetailed well with territorial nationalism and uh, the idea that once Persian poetry re leaves the domains of Iran and goes to India, it, it, it kind of, uh, uh, you know, experiences a decline, which I actually am happy to say that um, Afghan scholars at this time are very skeptical of this narrative of, of decline. They don't buy it, uh, it, it they, and, and their historiography is not punctuated so sharply by, you know, this, this kind of uh, uh, rise, uh, decline, and then resurrection, and also their approach towards uh, Persians encounter with Islam and Persians encounter with Arabic is one of reconciliation uh, and, and, and generative interplay and not in the case of Iran, which is very anti antagonistic and, 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 and hostile. I'm gonna go ahead and skip a few uh, paragraphs um, and read the last two. Largely unexplained and context dependent, the term sack or style appeared in Bahar scholarly articles in the 1930s where it performed different functions. In his article, in the style of Persian poetry, which did not allude to the most salient features of the, uh, that, that distinguished different types of Persian poetry. In this context, style broadly referred to a method of poetic composition unique to Persian language poets in contradistinction to other literary traditions. It functioned as a rhetorical device designed to decouple Persian from Arabic and far from a fixed category in his writing. Style is primarily used by Bahar to give a narrative form to Persian literary history. Through his periodization scheme, Khorasani, Iraqi, and, and so forth, Bahar gave an inner logic to the emerging narrative of Persian literature as the cultural heritage of Iranians. He deployed environmental thinking to identify Iran as a heartland of an otherwise polycentric literary tradition. He deployed in his writings on style, in a he deployed, he deployed style in a multivalent manner, never settling on a working definition or set usage of this rubric prior to the 1930s, which is the institutional turn for, for Persian literature, not just the University of Tehran, but you have the Academy of, of Persian Language, you've got the National Archive and, and, and so many publishers and what. In locating Bahar's poem in my elementary textbook a quarter century later, I came across a glaring example of state censorship in the ninth bait. The line should have read, you, the earth's raised fists, rise to the sky and deal many a blow to Rey, uh, the, the city near the capital Tehran. And in a note, Bahar explained that he composed the poem in 1922, 101 years ago, in response to the targeting of writers and the press by the Qajar state. 
So his poem calls on Mount Damavan to strike the capital in retaliation. In my textbook, the word re had been changed to ve. I don't know if that was the, the case for you, meaning self or own, which makes absolutely no sense. You, you, you don't call on Mount Damavan to strike itself. Was this an effort to define a poem critical of a dynasty historically twice removed by the Islamic Republic, which seems to be afraid of its own shadow? Regardless of intent, the censors had erased that historical reference that would have invited questions about Bahar's milieu in the classroom. So as scholars revisit Bahar's contributions to Persian literature, we should foreground the dynamism and uncertainty of his times and consequential career. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad I have this opportunity to respond to these, these two papers. And uh, I have some comments and then leading to, uh, or yeah, a commentary leading to two questions for each of you. And the commentary, I guess, is, is perhaps uh, aligned more to the rest of the audience rather than you two specialists who perhaps know uh, at least as well as I do um, what I'm talking about here in my comments. So starting with, with you, Alexander. Um, I was really very interested and, you know, so much in line with what I guess we've been thinking together, together and separately in, in our work in these recent years of these intellectual networks, which are going in a sense from India to Europe and then in, in a sense up from, on the one hand, from India to Iran. On the other hand, by the 1920s, we start to have Iranian uh, scholars, civil servants, sort of hyphenated of the two, going to study uh, in Europe as well, whether in Paris and Berlin or indeed sort of visits to London. And of course, this is a full 50 years really after from the 18, 1869, I guess, and the 1870s with new changes of laws at Oxford and Cambridge or uh, admittance laws, when if you're uh, a British or an Irish Catholic, you can't go to Oxford and Cambridge, but Indians are allowed in. And you start to have the, the key figure here for this discussion is to say that Ahmad Khan, who goes in 1869 then to to bring his son to study at Oxford. And this is the same Sayyid Ahmad Khan who becomes the, the nature and the founder of the, uh, the uh, anglo Mohammedan uh, MAOC, Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental College at, at Aligarh, the great sort of institutional center of, uh, of, of the sort of scientific modernism of Islamic reform. But, but I think what I want to focus on here is one of the outcomes of this, is this increasing rise of historicism that you sort of mentioned yesterday, it's so innate to how we think. And we often look back at uh, our own sources and sort of, you know, kind of frame that these are, these are natural things of the historicist thinking here. But I think it's, it's important to identify when we start to get sort of a modern historicism rather than the sense of, of the continuity of tradition, which I think goes back to the discussion earlier of texts that transcend space and time, because these are this isn't a historicist way of, receiving and thinking about earlier literary or religious texts, etc. But still, with, with Sir Sayyid himself, one of the things that comes com immediately out of that 1869 through the Suez Canal, just as opened that journey to London to take his son to Oxford, is he writes a new historicist biography of the Prophet Muhammad that's in response to critiques of a sort of, well, I don't know if they're Orientalist or not, but, uh, but certainly a particular uh, critical uh, 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 a biography of the prophet, but nonetheless, although it's a countertext, this famous uh, biography of the Prophet Muhammad by Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, it's using the new, if you like, kind of source critical methods that will start to be used by so many uh, historians and historicist historians, uh, historicist Muharik, I suppose, uh, across Islamic Eurasia, Tatars perhaps as well, Devin, maybe you can fill us on those two. And then I was also thinking of that other key figure that you were mentioning about Sh uh, Shibli Nomani and his trips then uh, again through the Suez Canal with Sir Thomas Arnold, who is the professor of Arabic at the Government College Lahore, who will of course be a, a big influence on, on Iqbal, Muhammad Iqbal as well. And Shibli uh, goes then to look at the Egyptian and Ottoman schools and their new modes of teaching Arabic and takes them back, doesn't it, to, to India in turn. And his student, and this is the figure I want to zoom in on a bit more really, in the early 20th century, in the 20s and 30s, or 10s, 1910s and 30s period you're, you're focusing on in particular, is Suleiman Nadvi. Uh, and what interests me here with Nadvi and with the sort of these intellectual networks that you've been discussing, which are between Europe 
India and Iran in different configurations, or maybe you know, in the context of our conference, maybe this isn't Europe, but it's Western Eurasia, and these are the sort of this is sort of intellectual scope the, the geography we're looking at. And Suleiman Nadvi then starts to make makes uh, some important journeys in preparation for the new literary histories he'll write. He'll write a number of literary histories, <coughs> not least of of figures such as Omar Khayyam, and he starts consulting then the library, the manuscript collections in places like Leiden, but also the India office in London and Cambridge. And he's hosted by E.G. Brown, who of course at this point he's writing his famous multi-volume literary history of Persia. And, and, and Brown is hosting a whole series of Middle Eastern, Iranian, Indian scholars in Cambridge. There's a, 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 a I think in the archive, his archive at Pembroke, uh, that there are the letters that he exchanged in Persian with a range of Indian and Iranian scholars. And Nadvi, in, in turn, later published his, uh, his the Urdu letters he was writing back home from London, describing his meetings with Brown and uh, other and, and visits to the, the manuscript collection. So again, we get this methodology of looking at manuscripts and comparing manuscripts as well, the new kind of critical literary history studies. One other sort of uh, similarity here, uh, I thought that perhaps is worth bringing up of a name that you didn't mention. Um, vis-a-vis -vis civilization, Tamadun, and this, in a sense, this calc neologism, I guess. Um, and that's Gustave Le Bon, who'd been translated into Arabic, he'd been translated into Urdu, La Civilisation Arabe, gone into to Arabic and, and into Urdu. And then I think it's by the 1930s that it go, it's translated into Persian. But interestingly, and kind of rather fun, it's not translated as Tamaduni Arab, because by the 30s, that'd be what? Is there such a thing? It's Tamaduni Islam. You know, so, so that's kind of an interesting element there. But still, this again, this movement of this term of, of, of Tamadun and this concept. So my questions are really, particularly with, with Jalal ad-Din Humayi, is there a link here in so far as when this is appearing in, I forget what date it was, you said 1935, but is there any link here with, with um, <clears throat> E.G. Brown's Literary History of Persia, which has been published by at this point? Um, and then more broadly, so in so far as you're using a sort of terminology of the Persian age as a sort of framing concept, what does this European or West Eurasian sort of impact of maybe Brown or certainly Darwin, as we've been discussing, do to your concept of, of Persian eight? Not least in so far as there have been discussions, publications, you've been involved in the two of after the Persian eight. But so I was struck by you and sort of said, well, this is still Persian. Maybe you, yeah, I'd leave you to respond to those first and then I go into audio to say testing the memory as well. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Thank you for this. You know, it's interesting when you brought up uh, Gustav de Bon, and I, I published on this. His translator into Persian, Tafir Bayi is the same who translates Shibli from Urdu into Persian. Oh, great. Is this in your book? It's, it's in the, my article in Iranian Studies that came out, I can't remember last year, I think, in the issue that Aria. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. Um, the the E.G. Brown, Edward Randall Brown, is, is very much part of this, um, less so for Hawaii, but, but certainly for. Um, for Bahar, um, who, who cites and, and engages with him, but also for, for Shibley, you know, this is, he's really part of, part of the story in that, you know, Shibley will publish a, a volume of, of Cheryl Ejab, his, his history of, of poetry, and then Brown reads that and, and cites that and is engaging with it. And then Shibley, I mean, these, these volumes are coming out, like each of them are like a multi, you know, four and five volume work, and they're really coming out in conversation with each other. And as you point out, um, Suleiman Nudvi is part of the um, infrastructure making that conversation possible. Um, so, so certainly Brown is, is part of the story. Why I, I, the argument, one of the arguments I'm trying to make in the book is, is exactly this, this, uh, this last point that you brought up, that the Persian, it remains a useful framework that, that's again, I mean, it's, it's shifting, it looks different, in the 19th or early 20th century than it did before, but it looks different in the 16th century than it did in the 9th century. So why should we why should we think of it as, as static? Um, English, uh, as, as I argued also in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a separate piece, English becomes, I think we can think of as, as like a Persian, um, as a part of the Persian, at least as much as we can think of other um, Turkish or, or uh, say, minor peoples of the Persian or are Georgians or Armenians or, or something. And Brown is the perfect example of that. He's somebody who's 
not just has a proper other education, but he's, he's writing, including in Persian, like the letters that you mentioned, his correspondence contributing to this. And it's it's not strictly, I think it's we miss a lot if we just read that as well, he's an Orientalist who's who's producing knowledge that belongs to a separate tradition. Because people like Shibley and in, in India, people like Bahar and Iran are reading him, engaging with him, they're not treating him as an outsider. They're treating him as somebody who has really interesting, innovative ideas, and that's influencing that that kind of you know new sort of historicism and way of thinking about what is the task of literary history. Um, but it's not like an alien. It's it's not like he's an alien to their tradition. He's treated as an insider, and he's and he sees himself as, as an insider. He goes when he's when he's in Iran, he's like a, a Persian nationalist. Or, you know, he's a street uh, named after him. him. He is a street, yeah, he's totally seen as an insider. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the book. I've been waiting for decades for John Gurney's biography of Brown, which is probably never going to appear. So, yeah, right. <laughs> I invite people to get pastries. Unfortunately, we have no time for. Uh... <laughs> I can give you the paper version, you won't get away that early anyway. Easily. So, Aria, I, I was really fascinated with, with your focus on the question of. of well, style, style as sabk. And, uh, and rather like sort of, you know, tamadun, these sort of calc words, it's a sort of a, a, a neologism in some sense, if that's the word or calc translation and a pre-existing word that's given some new, you know, new, new usages and perhaps new, new layers of meaning. And I was really, really excited by the way you're identifying Bahad and the, the sort of the early genealogy of, of how he's coming up with this idea. Because not least because, it, it, well, on the one hand, it links to this sort of rise of, of historicism as a mode of looking at all sorts of things. You know, now it's adab that has to be, well, adabiyat, as you pointed out, and there's this new plural that has to be historicized as well. You know, kind of not, not in a, the mode of an older tazkara, let's say, you know, kind of, which might have people's dates and so on, but there's not sort of this use of a, the analytical key of style to do the, you know, to actually do a historicizing work. One wouldn't get that clearly in an earlier Tazkara. And what excited me in particular is because I've recently been working on the rise of, of art history in Urdu rather than in Persian, but I want to look on the Persian, the Farsi early 20th century materials too. And there as well, because with the rise of European art, or particularly architectural history, which is what effectively gets written in Urdu, that, not, not really objects or it's really architectural history. And, and there, of course, it's style as well becomes the, the, the means by which the style of different buildings, which we kind of do history. And, and there's a whole series of translations that are made into Urdu um, and, and into Arabic. And, it's, and then it comes up with the, what's the word for style? So there's various kinds of questions. Of, and one of the curious things is, is there's a, that one of the works I look at, what's the word for tile? And you think even in Urdu is not word for tile, and that's actually it's tile. And still in, in, in Urdu today, I had a conversation with uh, who we're talking about at, at Columbia, um, Manan Ahmed, and I said in, in Urdu today, what's the word for, for tile? So teal is now, <laughs> but this text is tile, and there's a footnote saying well in Farsi they 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 say. Uh, Kashi, but that's only the real name of a place, Kashan. So that's not a proper word anyway. So we're not going to borrow that. So we'll stick with Thailand. Anyway, but this is probably these neologisms or, 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 or loan words. And there too, in the art historical or the historicized approach now to buildings, for example, is, is the point, as well as to, to Adar. The, there's the question of, well, how do we translate style? And then Tal is there which as far as I'm aware then, it had a sort of older usage as a literary term but you wouldn't have talked about the tadas of a building. Again, happily to be you know, corrected on this. But again, this term gets deployed as a need to translate a term and not necessarily to just transliterate the style. And by, by the time we get to the 1930s and 40s, these decisions seem to have been settled on. And there's, a, there's now a sort of, by this point, at least in Urdu, a settled lexicon of historicized history of art and architecture. So that really interested me too. And there's been some interesting work, a really fascinating article, I forget the author, on the, the use of fan and fan becoming in Arabic, but also in some Urdu and Persian. That's the word for art now. So fan has any pre, correct me, professor, uh, but it's the earliest sort of classical Arabic use of the fan being like art, 
arts for all sorts of things the handicraft not just let's say art as a sort of distinctive the one thing and then fun gets used in this way as well but in the urdu case it's sometimes simply art because it's this quest for a conceiving of these things in a new way but the historicist element talus is really key the other element that really excited me in, in what you were talking about was the, the, found, the founding of the, the Danish Kade as an, as an Anjuma in 1916. And this made me think of the, you know, the associational culture, which is you know, such an element of, of, of 19th century Indian and more broadly, and certainly sort of Indian Muslim sort of uh, cultural life as well, especially in these cities, Bombay and Cal Calcutta, which have these big Iranian publishing diasporas, the newspapers, of course, in, in both in Calcutta and Bombay, the founding of the, of the uh, Mohammedan Literary Association in, in Calcutta uh, in the later 19th century. And one thing I thought of in particular, it took me back to my, back to my Zoroastrian days again, as yesterday. And, and the Anjumani, I think it was called the Anjumani Zatushtiyan, founded by Manikji Limji Hatari, the Bombay... Parsis or Astrian who goes to Yazd and has this you know, big impact there. And I remember reading many years ago, I think it was my, by an article maybe by Mary Boyce, uh, that this Anjumani Zatustian, if that was the correct name, Manikjis, was the first Anjuman founded in Iran. So I wondered about that because if that's the case, that is in a sense like, you know, kind of the, that, that link between the, what, what uh, actually Manish has been doing of the impact of the, of the Bombay passes, first of all, on the Iranian Zoroastrians, Iranian Zoroastrian intellectuals, and then more broadly, Muslim nationalist intellectuals like Ibrahim Pur Davud by the 30s and 40s. So, yeah, this Anjuman stuff really got me thinking. And another link as well, it made me think of Sapi Ali Shah. So, the big reviver of Sufism in Iran in the 19th century, who spent his time in Bombay, publishes his first book there. Uh, Asura, with the help of the Agha Khan the second who's now in Bombay who patronizes it and when he goes back to Iran he settles in Tehran writes his great uh, commentary on the Masnavi which is printed as a lithograph and then the year he dies the the Anjumani Ukhavat is founded which will be you know has all these different purposes mixed with Freemasonry symbols etc but is in a sense I'm thinking now here I hadn't thought about this before but, you know, think of the Anjuman as an Anjuman, the Anjuman Yopovat as an Anjuman, but also as a literary association, de facto, insofar as, as I understand it, what their big activities were, apart from the socializing and the networking, presumably of any Anjuman, and any Anjuman, was using Sapi's great commentary on the Masnavi. So I thought of that too, and that's founded in 1899-1900. So these earlier, perhaps Bombay and... Uh, uh, Bombay links really via Manikji and uh, Safi and you know joining your two papers together in a way so yeah my first question then is you know since you have your book coming out which are you know kind of have you explored these things more is there something of an, an Indian genealogy to for Bahar or for his his uh, Anjuman that uh, you know perhaps the nationalist historiography hasn't picked up on and my other question then, you know, given all the work you've been doing with, with, with Afghanistan as well, is, is there an impact in turn then from the Amakhan Journal, from the Amakhan Journal to the Majale Kabul, the Kabul Journal, the first Afghan literary journal founded by the Anjumani Adibi Kabul in 1931, so a decade or more afterwards. So, you know, I'm looking at this again, in this case, India to Iran, and then in this case, Iran to Afghanistan. I think this is one of the limitations of uh, looking at text and print. Uh, you know, I was aware that, you know, Muhammad Hossein Furugi, I think, is one of the first texts, earliest texts that I've found is unpublished literary history where he talks about Adabiyat and he uses it in a completely new valence, right? Um, but obviously, that's just not going to happen overnight. I'm pretty sure two, three decades before these Anjumans that you're talking about or, or Sabidil in Afghanistan, there's so many uh, courtly salons and readings. Unfortunately, they haven't left behind texts yeah. and it's extremely difficult to figure out what is happening. Uh, one way is to read these translations that happened in the Ghajar period by the Royal Translation Bureau. Um, and I've neglected them. Uh, because my focus was very narrow. 
how did this idea become thinkable? And then we became institutionalized. And I think the further back you go, the picture gets messier. And that's a good thing. It, it, it really is a good thing. Um, much the same way that he's throwing around Shive and Tavs and Sap, uh, with, at least to my eye in an interchangeable way, because he's trying to form a disciplinary lexicon. Um, our colleague, Shahla Fargadani, uh, has written a great article in Iranian studies looking at a much earlier text, Ohadi, uh, and she firmly believes that Bahar is drawing on a much longer tradition of stylistics. Um, and I was able to ask uh, Shafi Katkani through one of his students that uh, about this, and he said yes. When he was in Khorasan, when he was in Mashhad, he in fact studied with a with an Adib Nishaburi name figure that specifically taught him Sat, probably not by that name. Um, what is very clear is that he's drawing on multiple traditions: the French and and the Persian tradition, right? And I I haven't looked at it from a more technical point of view of what, what is he exactly trying to get at. But it's very clear that in this period, things are really messy. He's really throwing spaghetti at the wall with, with, with Sap just using it in all sorts of ways. Um, and whether there are connections between him and Indian and Jumans, I do mention that uh, thanks to the great work of uh, Ryan Perkins, um, Anjuman Tarari Urdu and, and all these uh, Anjumans, because I do think that they're definitely are informed by European, you know, they're constantly talking about Académie Française, which to be honest, I think is a bit overstated its importance. And, you know, the bylaws that are new, these new structures, president and vice president and, and all these roles um, are definitely informed by both Indian and, and, and European Anjumans, because the truth of the matter is that compared to the Ottoman lands and then Republican Turkey and, and uh, British India, Iran and Afghanistan come into uh, you know, the picture when it comes to print culture much later. Uh, and so the, the, there's definitely, and, and not to mention all the, the publications that were you know, like Akhtar and Hikmat and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and whatnot, and I've looked at them and I didn't find, again, what I was looking for, a specific li literary conceptualization, right? But it would be interesting to, it really would be interesting to go back the way Alex is and with now a, a less obsessed pair of eyes trying to finish a dissertation or finish a, a tenure book, um, but I'm absolutely abandoning the project because I have too much climate anxiety. I'm gonna work on the climate novel. Uh, and then with the second question, uh, Armagan actually had more of a dialogue with Herat, with the journal Herat, oh, okay. which was a byproduct of Anjuman Adabi Herat. Um, they published and republished each other's articles uh, and whatnot. You know, a really good place where you could see Afghan scholars charting their independent path is uh, Encyclopedia Ariana, which is the first modern encyclopedia in Persian, where, for instance, one way they challenge Iranian historiography, like Bahar is, uh, they're reading all these texts, by the way. They're, they're, they're citing Azad and Shibli, and they're, they're citing you know, uh, Arabic language writers. One way is that ba Bahar says, Bazgashta Adabi is unique to Iran. And the Afghans are like, okay, Sabke Bazgasht, va Sabkai Digar. Uh, they they just insert their you know and then there comes some forty pages of names of Central Asian and Afghan poets probably most of it compiled by Khal uh, Khasta uh, uh, from Bukhara who came to Mazar Sharif and then moved to Kabul uh, Mulana Khasta and and so they're they're not they're they're not buying the Iranian narrative they're sometimes refuting it. But, but definitely deeply engaging it. And, and unfortunately in Iran, no one seems to be looking at these things. Even in the Ferdowsi University of Mashhad, which is closer to Herat than it is to Tehran, someone like, uh, uh, you know, a, they have two scholars that specifically work, Zarghani and uh, uh, another, Futuhi, who work on literary history. 
and they just completely ignore. It's funny because they're now Urdu is under radar, but Afghanistan is still just blackout. Yeah. If if I may, just one other little sort of follow up, but you know, kind of these geographies were happening. But when you mentioned Anjumani Adibi Urdu, so I'm thinking, well, this comes out of the Nizam state of Hyderabad, which in 1885, but much later than anywhere else in South Asia, or at least of any place, state of significant size, but finally disestablished Persian as the state of bureaucratic language. And then it sort of has this Urdu awakening. But it's there also, that of course, you have the, the, the great uh, encyclopedia there too. So the, there's all these activities that are going on with Arabic, still with Persian, and certainly with Urdu. And this is this is not India per se, it's not British India, this is Hyderabad, it's a big centre of of broader literary Muslim patronage. The last, of course, Ottoman daughters, the last Ottoman yeah, married into their, yeah, yeah, so they're trying to, you know, particularly by the, even more so by the 1920s, they're yeah, but, really sort of, you know, I mean, claiming a lot of links and heritage that they're claiming of, across the Islamic like world. How Turkish trans speakers in this discussion is important because there are Turkish speaking uh, and intelligentsia in these areas sharing the same state as well as a, you know, Enjmeni Danish and uh, Ottoman Empire was established, if I'm not mis mistaken, 1851. And before that, Enjmen pops up early 19th century as an intellectual group like Palaides, etc. But before that, uh, kind of sometimes Enjmen is an interesting word. And also, Le Bon was translated, like discussed by Köprülü in 1913 as a you know orientalist approach and it is translated by Robert Stankov and uh, Gary Leisner uh, that article by Vlad Köprülü about the method in Turkish literature mm. where he postures against Le Bon's uh, nationalism by the Turkish nationalism he's a very young man at the time 21 or something but what I'm saying is like there were Iranian booksellers and Indian uh, merchants in Istanbul and some intellectuals traveled with them and uh, I, I wonder how it's figured like how Turkish figured in this India you know Afghanistan or to Persian story another question these were amazing papers I learned a lot like I mean I got really anxious here yeah, uh, like I'm excited about uh, the possibilities where uh, these may go especially thinking about like comparison, uh, like different registers in previous uh, panels just came up, like class, etc. But which Persian, for example, in Turkish nationalism, there was a pure Turkish created in Thessalonica, not anywhere else. And it came from Thessalonica. And intellectuals brought it to the center and it worked. Why? But it was kind of racing with this new forms of classical, like, Turkish, we are talking about composition, not like spoken language necessarily, but writing kind of a thing, writing and its importance may be an interesting thing to tackle just to identify when we say Persian or Urdu, we're talking about a certain register. Uh, it needs to be underscored because there are many Persians and Urdus and spoken and practiced and you know, competition like with Turkey spoken in the same areas, etc. Uh, anyway, this was really good. I'm very excited. So, I'd just throw in, if I quickly made the Nizams of Hyderabad. We never think of them that way, but yeah, they're yeah. Turkey. The Mir Khalid Khan is a yeah, Turkish founder of the Dani. Yeah, you remember the dissertation? If you have heard about it from University of Washington, he was looking at how Faz appears from Istanbul to India, and yeah. then compares like the. Uh, cloth merchants and how the aesthetics and the taste or the fashion developed. It's completed at the University of Washington, uh, William Bamber. Uh, so it was interesting because uh, there were a lot of communication with Ottoman, like Turkish speaking Ottoman subjects. We can call them Turks because in Anjumeni Danish, yes, they were using a Turkish, but they were Arab intellectuals, Iranian origin in Turkish. Like, it was a very interesting formation. Myth. Uh, 19th century. Uh, so, I mean, this is quite fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, a question I've been waiting on time. My apologies. Uh, a comment about the Bahar question. 
uh, as a historian that work on Safavid period. Uh, Bahar uh, and uh, some uh, uh, contem uh, his contemporary intellectual people from that time neglected of the uh, uh, plan and the style of Safavi. Uh, style and uh, they uh, come back to the uh, Sabke or Afani. Uh, but the Safavi style is very important, it's very critical, it's very uh, social, and uh, even it's uh, very political. And uh, they neglected, and uh, I think that uh, I'm uh, very glad that uh, they have. Uh, Yes, on your short hair, uh, attention to that mm -hmm. uh, and uh, try to uh, introduce uh, this poem uh, in the center of the period. Um, I will not say that. I that. agree, I agree completely. And I think you would be hardened when you look at the list of dissertations that are being defended in Iran. There's a group uh, on. Um, Telegram that I'm a part of when I'm not listening to Iran and shout at each other about Naya. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's they look, they actually show the, the published abstracts of recent dissertations, and, and Iranian academics are increasingly paying attention to Safavid and Mughal poet uh, recently, very recently. And I think that's a fantastic thing, and it, it shows that what you're saying is true. Yeah, exactly. Yes, Hassan, I think, oh, I think that's what you're saying. There's a question. Uh, if you're asking for Hassan, uh, it's what you're reading as well. But, um, you know, what the, the story that gets told about Ruby that you shared with us, it's, it sounds vaguely familiar to one story about it, to the conclusion that it was coming out of the wall, and perhaps people who had the sense of history. Really? So I'm wondering, you know, and of course, you know, a lot of these Ruby intellectuals. Or you know, they're looking to the English. So I'm wondering to what extent that's working in the background. Yeah, I mean, there's some, um, is it, I want to say, Green has a history of the English language, which is very influential for Brown and kind of models it on, on that kind of thing, might be remembering well, and also our Chisra on uh, history of the French, um, which are, um, it, you know, it's it's not just these models for thinking about English, but more broadly for thinking about language and nationality in general that I think are really informing the logic, especially of what you're speaking intellectuals. And these are categories that are more or less inherited from the British of like a people aligns neatly with a language, aligns neatly with a land or a nation. Um, that more so than than like they don't need English as a specific example because that's how they're thinking about every language. And that kind of informs the shift away from, from Persian as well after 1857. Um, the British are like, where, where how, how did this revolt have happened? Where did we go wrong? Well, we were operating in terms that don't make sense. Clearly, there are people here, they have a language that organically aligns with the people that organically aligns with this land land and our you know, governing strategies that are inherited from the mobile company for that point um, don't, don't work within that logic. And so therefore that logic has to be abandoned and there has to be a closer alignment of like rule of vernacular languages. Uh, that makes sense. So that answer your question. I wonder if there's a smoking gun there and all the literary histories of English that are translated is it would it do as part of these educational vernacular literary, the vernacular education society stuff. So yeah, I'm very curious about that. It's a great question. Nia, I, I mustn't allow myself to have the last word. So please. Alexander, thanks for the talk and I'm looking forward to reading the book. I was just getting curious about the uh, usage, just, uh, usage of historical linguistics and in the right about post Darwin. I was just wondering, why didn't they just go, did people go back and start reading William Jones and this stuff, or they always found inspiration in Darwin. And why was it Darwin so more readily accessible font of inspiration than the historical linguistics directly? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, uh, there are some intermediaries, temporal, let's say, intermediaries between Jones and, and Darwin, um, which is especially like European archaeologists 
um, who, are, who are doing work, uh, especially Germans, you know, doing work in Milan. Um, and so that's another medium for uh, accessing this kind of information that's about um, archaeology, historical linguistics, like that line of, of kind of uh, naturalism and historicism. Um, I think that the reason for why it goes through Darwin rather than Jones is because you know, Darwin makes a huge splash first of all in the European press, and then all of that is being received and translated yeah. in the Arabic press in a way that people are not talking as broadly about Jones. It's not like there are all these newspaper articles, at least that I saw. It's too early for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and, and also, just you know, one last point on that because Darwin is so controversial, you know, first for, for Christians, but then it's taken up in Muslim polemics. That again, I mean, that, that incites discourse, right? So more and more people are talking about it in a way that, that Jones is not, you know, getting anybody fired from universities or whatever. So how do you find Darwin and Wooten? I mean, what was the... Oh, what yeah, there's the... How did they do it exactly? There are these lines, if I were Ali, I would call them from my rank. Um, <laughs> but, um, from the mass of MD about... Uh, I was... Uh, <laughs> You know, I was born a mineral and died as a plant, and then I was born as an animal, and like these kind of transfigurations, which is really, it's it's kind of uh, the, the Aristotle's great chain of being, um, but that's being brought up, that's that's supposed to be like the proto-evolution you know, kind of language. Iqbal is doing this via with with those same lines, isn't he, Rumi? I think, and, but via Bergson, I think, because then you've had this sort of the Bergsonian spiritualist existentialism too which is, uh, yeah i don't know if that ever gets translated into into persian but there's it, an it, iranian go ahead no it did get translated into persian uh, from Urdu, not from english yeah right even though it was written in english yeah i mean this is also an extremely popular practice uh, and facile is exactly how it could be characterized where uh, you know these persian language you know uh, commentators on rumi and they're like rumi has uh, I wish I could do it in an Iranian accent as good, yeah. <laughs> Not my own. <laughs> you know, that Rumi contains all that we, we know that the scientists have told us, but all these, and then you know, Muslims say the same thing about the Quran, and uh, yep. That's it. Thank you both very much. Wonderful panel to finish with. We say thank you to the two parents. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 You are now unstructured play, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> there is still time available. And, uh, you know, um, so we can also, you know, we can also hang out. We can also have dinner in the evening. So we don't have to spread. We can get together. You know, it's really up to us. You know. Whatever. You're free. Free is hard. Well, I didn't talk about how to structure it. You did a good job.